oh yeah, you get all the omega-3s you need from eating plants. No, you get the wrong omega-3s. That's like saying you need water, water's a liquid, therefore drink vodka. Like, no, that's not, you need vodka. Vodka is the same, it's the same as water. If you just drink vodka, you'll get all the water you need. Well, there is water in vodka, that's true but it's not the same thing as just drinking water. And that's what they're saying too. You need DHA and EPA, those are omega-3s. Here's this other omega-3 too, same, same. No, you don't just need omega-3s, you need specific omega-3s. And uh, you don't want the ALA. All right, hello everyone. Sorry for the uh, uh, bit of a delay. I had a um, uh, another meeting that I was doing for my Patreon group, adding in another uh, Patreon tier question and answer session, sort of a live meeting with everybody where we all sort of just talk about whatever people want to talk about. So that's in my Patreon if people want to join that. But um, we do that, uh, adding in second ones. We do those twice a week. Um, and that's just one-on-one, -on -one, well, not well, group Zoom sort of thing um, as opposed to on YouTube. So uh, great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. I really appreciate it, sort of doing a new live time this week. Um, and I'm going to try to do these um, on, you know, twice a week now if we can. Um, but I was thinking of also, you know, some people have been suggesting doing like a starting a, um, uh, you know, YouTube membership thing and then having the some lives just dedicated just for for members. So uh, it seems to be some interest in that. So if that's something that that sounds good to you or people want to do because it sort of tightens things up and you get a bit more of a personal sort of approach to the question and answer sessions. Um, and that's something that you guys, you know, uh, sounds good to you guys, you know, maybe just comment in and, and sort of do a sounding and see what you guys think on that. Um, great. So we'll start off with the first question here. It's from uh, Hexen. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um, at least, well, I'm sorry. I'm just going to check my, I'll make sure everything's all, yeah. Okay. Um, from Hexen, thank you for the super chat. It says, what is the best way to start a baby at, at six to seven months uh, that is ready to start eating solid food on a carnivore diet? So, I mean, there's a lot of different techniques on, on, on weaning babies onto food that you can look up. I'm not an expert in that, but I do know that traditionally, and certainly what was done in my family, um, my great grandfather, who was, a uh, who was, a, a doctor graduated from Columbia university and, and the, early 1890s and um you know lived for 100 years and at home didn't have any any um cognition issues um what he did and what he recommended to my grandmother and my mother was uh you start babies on the drippings from a roast you have a big roast beef or whatever and you have the the meat juices that come on the cutting board and sort of pool up there and you just spoon feed them that and you get, you know, there's a lot of iron, there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, good vitamins and minerals and nutrients there. And sort of just starts making them taste this new thing um, and get used to that. And go, Ooh, that's good. That tastes good. Um, then after that, you know, so a lot of people will cut things up into very small pieces. Now this is, again, I'm not an expert in this, but from my understanding, that can be a bit more, of a problem because if you have these small things, those small things are the ones that get caught in their throat. They can't really chew them properly and they, they sort of have problems swallowing them. Um, what a lot of people do and certainly what, you know, is done in the wild with, you know, animals and humans is that you give them a bigger piece and then they're able to bite and tear off the, the pieces that are appropriate for them to chew. They're not going to take in a whole turkey leg, right? They're going to, they're going to be able to, to gnaw off and gum off, you know, with one tooth, just a little bit of, bit of that. And so that seems to be what um, I've heard recommended from people who are experts in it. Uh, I am not an expert in that, but that is what I've, I've uh, heard from other people and seems to work for them with their, their carnivore kids and from other people that are, that are more, more well-versed in, in uh, getting kids started on eating. Uh, JLP, thank you for the super chat. Um, he says, I'm a 16 year old man, six foot tall. I want to grow taller, but you say milk isn't optimal and that I should stick with meat. How can I use this diet to grow taller? How would you do it? I'd love a video on this. Uh, look, that's a good question. There's two ways to think about it. One, 
um, if you're eating what you're designed to eat, you're going to grow as tall as you're designed to grow. You know, you're not going to, you know, there are growth factors in milk, you know, so like raw milk, you know, if you get raw whole milk, um, maybe I, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Sivis, um, you know, says, thinks that, you know, like a bit of, a bit of milk with a, that, just that, that bit of a, of an insulin bump gets your, it doesn't get you crazy high, uh, you know, blood sugars and things like that. It doesn't get crazy high insulin. Although the older you get, it has more of a response when kids are younger, they, they, they're much easier to stay in, get into and stay in ketosis. So, um, you know, as you get older, I mean, you know, you look at adolescents of any species, right? They're not, they're not drinking milk, right? Um, they're drinking, they're, they're, you know, eating what, what the adults eat, you know, once you weaned on you mammals drink their mother's milk, then they weaned onto their mother's diet and they eat that for the rest of their life and they wean their children onto that. So, you know, the same would go for us. So I think you'll, you'll get very, very tall, um, uh, or as tall as you're genetically capable of doing so at this stage, if you haven't been carnivore your whole life, that, um, that you'll, you'll actually grow quite tall and like, uh, at least as tall as you're able to. Um, I think for me, the jury's out on, you know, adding in a bit of whole milk every now and then, is that going to, is that going to help with these growth factors and things like that? Maybe. Um, I don't, that's certainly not settled in my mind. For me, I would just do meat. Um, and uh, I would just eat just a ton of just fatty red meat. I'd eat until it stops tasting good every day, you know, and I'd, I'd you know, not gorge yourself in the sense that you're going to be uncomfortable and, and, and all that stuff. But I would make sure that you, you're eating as much food as your body is telling you to eat. And if you do that, you're going to you're going to grow like a weed. You know, 16 years old, most people won't have closed off their growth plates. And so you, you still have time to grow. Um, and so I, you know, I don't know how much you're going to grow, but, you know, there are people that have done this around your age and they, you know, they've had growth spurts since then. There's a, there's a guy, a professional soccer player. He does carnivore, mostly carnivore, and he's all into grounding and blue blocking glasses and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, all the, all the sort of things that you, you hear about in these sorts of circles and in his early twenties, you know, he's one of the top strikers in Europe and he, he grew like two inches, three inches, like in his early twenties, switching to, to a, a carnivore or carnivore ish diet. So I think you've got plenty of time to grow and, um, and that you just eat meat, a lot of fatty meat, red meat in particular, that's what you want to do. And uh, make sure you got enough B12. Make sure you're getting organs uh, because that's it, it's especially important to have abundant nutrients when you're when you're growing and developing. So you know some organs like liver, kidney, heart. Just you know throw this stuff in there. At least the liver. It's harder to get other things. Well, kidneys are usually pretty pretty easy to come by. Um, and just just have those. It doesn't have to be a mainstay of your diet, but just at least include them as a little bit, you know, because they're, they're very nutrient dense and you want, you want, uh, you want that nutrient content, but you don't want so much that it, it builds up, um, these fat soluble vitamins that are, that are too much. So that's what I would do anyway. Jill Taylor asks, carnivore for seven months, highest ever A1C at six, uh, at three months and seven months, glucose 92 and 106. Insulin 3.9 and 6.3. Highest prior was uh, 5.7. Long time healthy lifestyle, not overweight. Your thoughts? Uh, two things. One, there are there is a thought that the healthier you get, the healthier your red blood cells get, the longer they're going to live. So HbA1c is a marker of your three months average. And so um, uh, HbA1c of six will would actually denote a higher average blood sugar than than what you're getting there um so is that accurate uh, if your red blood cells are living three and a half months four months and you're comparing them to a three-month average obviously it's going to be a bit skewed same thing goes if you eat a lot of plant oil seed oils um they have plant sterols which are which are the plant's cholesterol and they they're close enough to our cholesterol that that our body uh thinks we have enough and we don't we don't make anymore sorry Oh, sorry. 
and we don't we don't make enough and so we don't have enough available to us and those plant sterols get used in the cell linings and the cell membranes uh, which is a lipid bilayer of cholesterol and then there's proteins and different sorts of molecules stuck in there so if you if you're eating plant oils and things like that your plant sterols are going to get into your cell membrane and uh, and they're not going to live as long because they're more stiff and rigid and so they die quicker because once they get too stiff your body pulls them out because they're not they can't get around these small capillaries and things like that so your, your spleen rips them out so if you're eating these plant oils and your your hb1c could be artificially lower because they're only lasting two and a half months not three months right and then you're eating only animal animal fat and you're not getting any plant sterols and now they're living longer than three months and so you can see a bit of a disparity there and a lot of and there are people that i know um that argue for this and some of them are, are endocrinologists and diabetes doctors and nurse practitioners that see this they have patients with constant glucose monitors and they're, they're spot checking to make sure they're accurate and they do not line up with their a1c and their a1c is markedly higher than, than their average of glucose. So I think you, you go by your your blood sugar reading, like your, your point tests, I would take that with more with with more weight than the HbA1c. The second point is, as I was talking to Dr. Rob Sivas, um, you know, who does a lot of this sort of stuff and uses low carb carnivore diets for his patients. And one thing that that he knows is that sometimes if people are not eating enough fat, um, they're they're forced to use their protein as energy and that can get converted into glucose and things like that and and if we're if we're having an abundance of of protein we're not getting enough uh fat then that can actually be converted into a bit more glucose and then gets subsequently stored in into your fat but for a little bit your your blood sugar is just a bit higher than it than it normally would be and that's potentially a problem too so um as bart k would say it's you know um Gluconeogenesis is demand driven. It's not substrate driven, but there could be a, you know, a bit of wiggle room there, you know, that sometimes you get a bit more than you want, just converting some of this stuff in. If you have an abundance of protein, you don't have enough fat. That's, that's a going theory anyway. So those are the two, two, uh, theories that are out there on what's going on. So check your blood sugar, just make sure that that's normal. And if that's just consistently at good levels, uh, of fasting levels don't worry about it like you're fine um you can also try increasing your 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 fat content another way of looking at that is if when you got your blood test done did you get your uh you know your your kidney functions done did you look at your urea and your bun and creatinine if your urea is going up or your bun is going up um you know and your creatinine is staying normal then your kidneys are fine but that's a sign that you're converting more uh, protein into energy because you have to cleave that amino group, um, uh, that amino group, and that turns into ammonia, which then gets turned into urea, which then has its own job in the body, and then it gets passed out in the urine, so or in the sweat. So when that starts creeping up, you know that's a sign that you're you're probably not eating enough fat. And you're being forced to use more of your protein, and you're using more protein than fat, and you need you need fat. So that's the thing too. So if your urea is up, eat more fat. Um, check your blood sugar, and make sure that uh, it's just uh, normal, normal blood sugar through most of the time. And then stress and sleep. These are very very important things that people just think that you just you just eat you know a carnivore diet. You just eat a proper biologically appropriate diet a proper human diet and uh and that and that's everything but but of course there's more to that that's a major thing that's, that's probably the biggest thing that people are doing wrong but sleep and stress are really important your stress goes up your adrenaline goes up your cortisol goes up your blood sugar goes up your a1c goes up if you're not getting proper sleep your adrenaline goes up your cortisol goes up your uh blood sugar goes up your a1c goes up uh dr tony hampton just had a short that i uh that just came out a couple days ago which was very, very pertinent to this discussion, which said if you get four, if you average sort of four or five hours of sleep a night for uh, you know seven days straight, you will you will become borderline diabetic. You'll become pre-diabetic. But then if you sleep for seven to eight hours for a week, that will reverse. So it makes a big impact on your body. And so if you're not sleeping well, 
or you're not getting proper amounts of sleep, proper quality of sleep, and your stress levels are up, that's also going to affect it. So just remember that. So those are, those are the main things that I would keep in mind. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product, not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off which also applies to subscriptions giving you 25% off total all right thanks guys Gordon Smith says what are your thoughts on carnivore priming saw another advocate offering a 90-day plan with two weeks of priming eating three meals or more a day for the first two weeks and then backing off the idea there is that it's just showing you how much you actually need to eat it which is generally a lot more than people think um, but not necessarily so it's very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet because it, you feel satiated so much more quickly. And so maybe you always feel satiated. I haven't, you know, eaten all that much. I haven't had a chance to, I was just very busy working very late until last night. And I was just like, I'm, I don't even feel like cooking. And so I'm just going to go to bed. And so I did. And now I'm doing this and I haven't, haven't eaten yet. And that's fine. I feel fine. Um, but in my early 20s, I did not eat enough. I would go three, four days without eating because I didn't feel hungry like I normally did. Now I know my hunger signals. My body's saying, yes, you know, it'd be good to get some food. But I'm not, you know, voraciously starving, you know. And um, and and we think of that starvation signal of, oh, we have to eat. That's what we think of as hungry. And when that calms down a bit, then we think, oh, I can stop. Because you have to stop when you're eating a normal diet because, you know, or well, Carnivore is a normal diet for humans, but when you're eating the standard sort of Western, you know, plant-based processed food garbage diet, you have to stop yourself. You have to limit yourself. You have to have portion control. You have to have self-control to say, oh, I'm just going to stop there because otherwise, you know, you do end up eating too much because your 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 hunger signals are just all out of balance. So um, you'll it's easy to undereat because you say, well, I, I've eaten enough. I, I feel like that's enough. I, I can stop there. And that's usually when you would stop, maybe even before that, if you wanted to, if you wanted to say trim and all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's not the case anymore. You eat until it stops tasting good. That's what you want to do. And so the priming thing, if done right, I think is, you know, can be beneficial where you're just, you're just eating until it stops tasting. good. now some of the, some of the priming, depending on who you hear it from, they say you have to just stuff yourself. I don't think you have to stuff yourself. I think you have to keep eating until it stops tasting good. Right. And so if it tastes good, if you finish a steak or you finish some eggs or some meat or whatever, and that last bite was like, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. You need to eat more. You need to make more, make another steak, make another burger patty, make some more eggs. You want to try to have leftovers. So especially in those those first that first 30 days, you want to endeavor to have leftovers. You should have leftovers every meal, right? And you and you try eating twice a day. You can do three times a day too. I think you get a bit tired and lethargic after you eat a big meal during the day. So it's a bit impractical sometimes. Um, you know, but see how you go. At least try that twice a day. If you're if you've got a lot of excess weight, you may only need to do that once a day. If you're working out a lot, expending a lot of energy, try it twice a day. You probably need more energy than you think, and so you just try that. And but I think the way you do priming is, yeah, yeah, you can. You just say I'm going to eat twice, three times a day, whatever, and I'm going to keep eating until it stops tasting good. If it stops tasting good on the first bite, you stop there. You don't just stuff yourself. It's a it's it's just telling yourself and training yourself to know what hunger actually feels like, what being full actually feels like, what your body signals are telling you. You have to relearn your hunger signals, and so part of that is by retraining this and saying, okay, well, how much my body actually want? Well, I could stop, but all I I could always eat more. There's a lot of people saying, it's like, oh, I I could eat more, but I felt fine. I didn't need to keep eating. It's not about that. It's about if you felt like you could eat more, eat more. If you're eating the right thing, then your body's giving you a signal to do that. And that's what you want to do. So in that sense, I agree with that. You really want to make sure you're eating enough. 
Um, and some people have a problem with that. And some people have a real problem with, um, you know, getting enough in and because they just, they just feel fine, you know, and I've, you know, I've known people that, that do that and they're losing way too much weight and they're not healthy. Well, I mean, they're, they're healthy, but they're, it's not, they're losing an unhealthy amount of weight and they're, you know, they're, they're losing more muscle mass than they, than they should. Um, and, and I press upon them, you, you need to eat more. You have to eat until it stops tasting good. Not just until you think it's fine to stop. That's the difference. So that's what priming comes into. I don't think you need to overdo it. I don't think you need to stuff yourself. I don't think it's a good idea to eat past the point of enjoyment because now you're, you're getting an unhealthy relationship with food. Food should be enjoyable. It should be good. It should be a, a nice experience. And then it stops and, and your body going to tell you when to stop because it's going to stop being enjoyable. Once you get to that point, that's when you stop. And so if you're doing that three times a day and you eat the first couple of times and you eat a lot on the first time and you eat a little bit on the second time and then the third time you just be like, this sounds wretched. Then you take a bite and like, I'm not enjoying this. Don't eat it. That was your meal. So you, you maybe give it a try. I think twice a day is more than enough, especially for people that aren't underweight. You know, if you're coming from you know, veganism, anorexia, those sorts of things where you're undernourished, probably give it a try three times a day, see how you go. If you're overweight and, you're, and your body's trying to, you know, expel and expend excess energy, you probably won't need to do it more than twice a day, usually only once a day. But make sure you keep eating until it stops tasting good, high fat, very high fat. That is very important. It's an essential nutrient. It is not just a calorie source, you know. It is, um, it's essential. You have essential fatty acids that you have to have, or you get sick and you can die. And there are essential fat soluble, uh, vitamins and minerals that you have to have, or you get sick and you die. Right. So very important. Eat a lot of fat, eat until it stops tasting good. Try that twice a day or even three times a day if you want and stop when it stops tasting good. And then after that, maybe you 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 know, your body says, Oh, I really just can do just once a day and that's good for my body then that's what you do. If it's you need to eat twice, then you do twice. If you need to eat three times, you eat three times. But you keep eating until it stops tasting good, and you try that a couple times a day just to test and see how much your body wants. And when if you're losing body fat and you get down to a stable body fat percentage, your appetite will increase dramatically. So it's that same principle. You have to teach yourself to eat until it stops tasting good, not just eat this amount, right? Because it's going to change. It's going to change depending on your body composition, depending on your, um, you know, uh, energy level or, or your, your energy expenditures and working out and all these sorts of things, you're not going to figure that out. You're not going to calculate that out with any real exactitude. So just let your body do it because it's, it's, uh, it's brilliant at it. It's designed to do that. Santa nails. Thank you so much for the super sticker. That's very kind of you. Uh, Penelope Husker has a super chat. Thank you so much. And it looks like there's a question attached down here. So, uh, thank you, Penelope question. Can you remind me again, how you dry edge your steaks? Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So <clears throat> yeah, so there's wet edging and dry edging. If you just get the vacuum sealed pack of a big cryo vac piece of meat, like a ribeye loin, then, and you just put that in the fridge, that's wet aging. You leave that for a couple of weeks and it tenderizes and actually it tastes uh, quite a lot better. Um, and then, and then, um, the wet age, the dry aging part, I don't do like the whole dry aging. Like you, you'd see in like a, um, you know, like a butcher shop or whatever that does dry aging. I have these big racks of meat up there. Um, I do an individual steak. So I just let them dry out really. So it's not, you know, some people call it dry brining. I, um, I learned this from Alton Brown, who's a, like a celebrity chef. Yeah, I sort of saw him. My mom uh, put me onto it because she she uh, watches a lot of those sorts of things. And um, you just cut up the steaks into the, the amount of size that you want. I, I generally go pretty big, like three inch thick steaks. And um, and then you salt to taste. I don't use much salt anymore. I generally don't use salt at all. Um, but that can sort of help soak the salt through and help it dry out a bit. And and then you just leave it in the fridge on a wire rack in a cooking tray or like a baking sheet. And um, and uh, and you just leave it there. They can't touch. You don't want them touching anything else. They have to have air circulating around all sides to dry it out. You, when you dry things out, they become um, they become sterile, right? So this is, the, this is how alcohol 
sterilizes bacteria and viruses, <clears throat> it desiccates them, it dries them out. So it's very volatile. So you put alcohol in something and just, it'll just evaporate very quickly and just dry out everything else. So all the bacteria there just get, just like sucked all the, the moisture out of them and they just, they just die. So that's how that works. And that's what you're doing in the fridge. So you're letting it dry out. You're letting it dehydrate. You don't want it covered. You say, oh, you need to cover. You need to do this. That traps in moisture. That's going to allow bacteria to grow. You want it dry. So you let it dry. If they're, they're two pieces of meat are touching and they're on top of each other, that's an area of moisture. That's a point of contact and moisture. Then that's going to grow bacteria or, or can grow bacteria. So you just want it, you know, air circulating on all sides. And that's what you do. And then you start taking these things out. So you leave it in overnight or a couple of days, dries it out more, reduces the water content, uh, browns a lot better, tastes a lot nicer, it concentrates that flavor. And uh, depending on, on the thickness of the steak, you can do that for weeks. I mean, it's, never, it's eventually it's just going to turn into beef jerky, right? Which is also good. So, um, but it won't rot. It won't go bad uh, unless there's moisture. And that's what I do. And it tastes way better. I do that with any piece of meat. I'll just you know, salt it if I'm salting it and, um, and put it in the fridge and, and leave it overnight to, to dry out a bit. It tastes amazing. Fish, chicken, all that stuff. I wouldn't leave chicken and fish too long. Um, but I do that with, with, with any meat, any meat that I do. I prefer that if I'm, if I'm able to do that. Spencer Peterson, thank you for the super chat. Um, Spencer says, got bloods back, uh, after one month of strict carnivore. Looking good, except uh, insulin was high at seven. Insulin, I'm assuming that's insulin. At seven, cholesterol was uh, very high. Um, LDL uh, in the 400s, HDL in the 40s, but triglycerides were in the 300s. Is that a concern? Uh, no, not necessarily. You know, one month is still early days. We don't know what your numbers were before that. Um, if you didn't get your numbers before, you went carnivore, um, then I would just use this as a baseline for comparison in coming months. High cholesterol, I'm not worried about. High LDL, I'm not concerned about. They're both associated with longevity. Uh, and also, there are just scapegoats for heart disease. Triglycerides, you don't want that high. So um, hopefully that's coming down, I mean, and it would. You know, Triglycerides come down when you go up when you're eating carbs, sugar, and alcohol, and seed oils. But when you're uh, just eating just meat, they come down. So, and as, as long as you were fasting and you're fasting for similar amounts of time and you weren't exercising, and you didn't have sex and you didn't do all these other sorts of things, you didn't have high stress, then you can, you can look at that because stress, exercise, sexual activity, they all will mess with your cholesterol numbers. Right. And so, you know, you need to, you need to do this in a consistent manner where you're, you're, you're eliminating all those things. And just keeping it the same amount of fasting. If you fast for 10 hours versus 12 hours, you're going to have different results on your, on your cholesterol, which again is why cholesterol is a really bad metric. It's just, it's just all over the place. You know, if you check your cholesterol 10 times in a day, you'll get 10 different answers, right? So this is, you know, it's uh, it's, it's a bit weird, but use this as a baseline. Um, get your bloods taken consistently. First thing in the morning, fasting from the night before, same time, same hydration status, same amount of water in the morning. Don't take pills or medications or, or supplements in the morning. Um, no sex, sexual activity or stress in the morning or the day before you're getting these tests done. And then just, you know, get more data points. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, insulin being at seven, that's actually, that's not, not all that high. I guess it depends on what country and what scale you're using. But in uh, Australia, it's not high. In America, it's maybe just slightly above optimal. Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, for American numbers, you know, between two and six is great. Um, and, uh, you know, and just, you know, below nine is, uh, is great in uh, Australia. So depending on where you are, uh, I still think that that's probably fine. And again, this is your baseline compare it in a, in a few months. I mean, give it, give it some months, you know, one, one month is, uh, you'll see differences, but you'll, you'll get a better impression after about three months. So that's what I would do. And, um, I just, I just think testing cholesterol is a, is a waste of time and money, but you can do that to check your, your HDL and your triglycerides. Because that's probably the only useful thing in there, except for high cholesterol and high, high LDL, uh, is associated with longer life and lower infectious disease and lower breast cancer and, uh, lower rates of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and dementia. So, uh, good. I'm glad you got high LDL. That's a good thing. 
Uh, Penelope, oh, we already did that one. Uh, Thomas C., thank you very much for the super chat. My mother has a, um, edema and taking water pills. She also uh, just diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. How do you think carnivore diet will help her lose water weight to get her off diuretics? Well, that's a, that's a good question. It, it may not. This is something that we, we can have health issues and medical issues that, that don't solely come from uh, as, as a byproduct of, uh, of the diets that we're eating. But your body can regulate itself a lot better when you're just eating what you're supposed to eat. Your body generally works the way it's supposed to work. Uh, a lot of people do clear up their edema or their lymphedema or um, other sort of pulmonary issues. It depends on what's causing them. It depends on what's causing the pulmonary hypertension. It depends on what's causing the edema. You know, if you have pulmonary hypertension, if you have, um, you know, right heart failure, you know, um, as a consequence of the pulmonary edema, or or if you have left heart failure that's causing the pulmonary edema, and you're getting back pressure, and you're getting right heart failure as a result of that, and you're getting peripheral edema and all these other sorts of problems, then um, you know it depends on what's causing that. But I have seen people when they go on a carnivore diet, they improve their ejection fraction, they improve their cardiac output, they they improve uh, by those metrics. Uh, that basically you could say is coming out of heart failure and heart failure can cause pulmonary edema. It can cause peripheral edema. And so if you, um, if, if, if you're able to reverse that and, and improve your ejection fraction, that could absolutely help with the pulmonary edema and the uh, peripheral edema. I wouldn't stop the medications that she's on. Um, at least not yet. You know, if she gets to a point where she's doing really well and she doesn't have any signs of these things, she could talk to her doctor and say, look, I changed my diet. I've lost a bunch of weight. I'm feeling much better. Can we try coming off these things? And if the doctor is down with it, they can, they can try that. And, um, you know, it's reasonable to do at that point. And then, um, and then see how she goes. If she starts getting the edema back again, she can always go back on the water pills. Um, the, the diuretics don't, don't, at least when I was going through medical school, didn't increase lifespan and, and uh, didn't change the course of the disease. Just help with symptom the, the symptoms. Now you can get you can go into to, to respiratory uh, arrest and and respiratory failure from getting so waterlogged. So obviously that's a good thing to not be in that situation. So in that sense, it can it can be uh, life saving in certain circumstances. Um, but in general, it just it's just more symptomatic and um, uh, relief. But obviously, it's going to cause a huge stress on the system. So I wouldn't stop taking her medication unless she's doing very, very, very well, and it's been you know a few months, and she's really consistent with the diet, and she's doing a lot better. And, and at that point, she can talk to her doctor about um, coming off if if it's appropriate. Cassandra, thank you so much for the super chat. 24, trying to conceive for two years. I have lean PCOS. I've tried keto uh, twice. And by day two or three, I get heart palpitations and vomiting. What's causing that? That's very, very interesting. Well, it depends on what you're doing on keto. Sometimes people do keto and they do keto treats and keto snacks and all this sort of other stuff with artificial ingredients and nonsense that obviously you don't want. I'm assuming you're not doing that because you're health conscious and you're trying to have a baby. Um, so maybe you're eating whole bunches of vegetables and all these sorts of things that are that are what we are told with a ketogenic diet you need because that's where all the nutrients are. In fact, all the nutrients are in the meat and the anti-nutrients are in the plants. There are nutrients in plants, but there's more anti-nutrients and there are more defense chemicals and toxins. So you know, that's, um, that's something to think about. So I, there is a difference between doing keto and carnivore, depending on the types of, um, vegetables and things like that that you're eating. But if you're eating just really high fat meat and you're really not eating much of the other things, you, you are less likely to get that stomach upset. Now, heart palpitations are, um, you know, that, that needs to be sort of qualified a bit. If you mean, palpitations as in you're getting irregular beats, you're getting extra beats, you're getting a fast rate. It's just really fast. And it's going above hundred at rest when you're calm and relaxed and you're just sitting there and your heart's just, uh, you know, beating very quickly. Then that's something you just need to go see your doctor about and see if there's an underlying condition that's, that's now 
manifesting itself when you're when you're changing your diet. What's more likely? <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> what's more likely <clears throat> and more common is um, is that when you run on ketones, you go into ketosis, which is when you get really get into ketosis around day two and three. That's when your ketone levels are high. Your brain runs pre um, preferentially on ketones. And that's when you have normal blood sugar and you have high ketones, your brain only runs on the ketones, at least two thirds of your brain do anyway. And so even though you have glucose available, it decides to use just the ketones. So that's a preference. It's preferring ketones. You don't need glucose for this. Some, some cells in your brain still use glucose and that's fine. You make glucose, but the majority of your brain prefers ketones. Your heart prefers ketones too. So when you are in ketosis and you haven't been in ketosis before all of a sudden your heart's running on rocket fuel where before it was on like you know crude oil right so it's a much better it's a much better substrate it's a much better um fuel source for your heart and so people notice they have a big strong heartbeats and maybe it's a bit faster but it shouldn't be over 100 at rest and so that's what that's what I found in myself. That's why I see in my patients. That's why I, I you know speak to people in um, uh, you know online forums and and online uh, you know Q and A sessions like this. Is that that's what they know is big, strong heart, and they can hear it in their ears. But it's a it's a normal rate. It's a normal rhythm. So it's a normal pattern. It's not too fast, and that's okay. So that just means your heart's running on rocket fuel now and it's a bit weird because ooh, what's going on and um that's okay as long as there's a normal rate and a normal rhythm then that's okay if it is not you need to go and get checked out by the doctor you can always get your potassium checked i have yet to see someone actually get you know uh lab confirmed low potassium on a carnivore diet um you you do get you can get some electrolyte spillage and wasting especially in the first few weeks most people just adjust to this and, and do fine with it and some people don't um and they they benefit from doing some electrolytes but i've never seen anyone like with clinically low uh potassium or uh, even magnesium or or uh sodium um, unless you're drinking like a bunch of coffee and that can strip out magnesium so so that's what i would do you know um low potassium like very low potassium causes uh the arrhythmia that causes the heart palpitations it causes are atrial fibrillation first generally and so you get a very fast beat and it's a very erratic pattern so just it's just it's all over the place right and it's very fast and you get lightheaded and you generally get symptomatic and you don't feel well um that's typical you don't always have to feel unwell but that's generally but that's the patterns very fast and it's and it's irregular, irregularly irregular. There's no pattern to it. It's just all over the place. And so if you're not getting that, if you're getting that, go to the doctor, get it checked out. If you're not getting that, it's just a big, strong heartbeats. It's the ketones. It'll, it'll wear out. It's not dangerous. It's just, it's just your body readjusting to a proper, uh, energy source for your heart. Obviously, if there's any concerns, just go see your doctor, get an EKG, and just make sure everything's okay. It generally is. A uh, question from Becky, Dr. C, can I reverse any effects of premature birth with carnivore? I was born at 24 weeks, almost 40 years ago. Well, it's, it's, it's going to improve your health as much as you can. So you're going to be the healthiest version of yourself that you can be uh, genetically and congenitally. So, I mean, there's going to be different issues that people have from being born premature, but you know, there's plenty of, of very... Um, successful and high functioning people that uh, were born premature. There was a girl in my class uh, in medical school that was born at 20 weeks, you know, so it's, um, you know, it just depends, you know, if, if, I mean, there can be harm done, you know, if that's very premature, you know, that's very, very early, but at the same time you're here and you're, you know, you're, you're, um, uh, you know, you're here and, and an active, healthy adult, hopefully, and a carnivore diet will improve that. You'll just be as healthy as you can be genetically. Now, if if you're if you were born at 40 weeks instead of 24, you know, would that potential be a bit higher? Possibly, but 
you know, we don't know. We have no way of knowing that. So don't worry about it. You know, the main thing is, is that this will make you as healthy as you possibly can be. And so it's, uh, you know, it, and it's making a lot of people, I mean, I wasn't born premature. I feel a thousand times better than I did, you know, when I was eating uh, a standard, well, not even a standard diet because I never ate that crap. You know, I, I never really ate processed food. I ate whole foods. I ate mostly meat, um, but I generally was low fat and I, I forced down, choked down vegetables and had some bread every now and then, you know, pretty damn clean from, from uh, most respects. And yet I feel a thousand times better now. So you'll feel, you'll feel much better as well. And it, it may not be able to undo all the damage that we do to ourselves or we were born with, but it will make you as healthy as you can be um, for your body. And that's, you know, that's actually really good. That's a lot better than people think. So good luck with that. Mary Shepard, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, truly several issues. Biggest one is a weight loss surgery sleeve. Uh, meats are so hard to get in for me. Uh, protein shakes an option. Yes, but you know, protein shakes, you're just going to have the protein. They're not going to have all the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you need along with the protein. Uh, it's not going to have the fat. You need fat. Fat's an essential nutrient. Remember? So with gastric sleeve, what you have to remember, obviously you have smaller, you know, surface or, or a smaller area inside your stomach. So you need to, you're probably going to need to eat multiple times a day and you need to eat obviously smaller amounts, very high fat. And you need to maximize the, the volume, the area in your, in your stomach just for meat. So don't drink water two hours before a meal and don't drink water with your meals. It may be some sips to get it down, but any water that goes in there, that's space that is now not going to be able to fit meat and you'll get full way too quickly. So just, um, you know, just, just have that in mind. Don't drink water two hours before you eat a meal or at least an hour before you eat a meal, because if you're eating multiple times a day, it's going to get a bit difficult to do that two hours. But if you start in the morning, you just eat as much as you can. Don't drink any water really. Unless you, you know, have to take some pills or whatever, you know, just do, but minimally. And, um, you know, and then later in the day, have a bit more, have a bit more, have a bit more. And you need to work in some water in there too, but try to separate it out, you know, with, with a good hour before, um, you know, between uh, water and meals. It's very important to do that because you need, you need all that space for food. Um, and most people do fine with that. I, I have a number of patients with gastric sleeves that, that that's what they're able to do. Um, so hopefully that works as well. You could do protein shakes. Most of them have a whole bunch of garbage in there that you don't want. So you want to go find the protein that have, um, you know, no additives, right? It's just the protein. So there's things that only have whey protein or things that only have beef isolate protein. Um, you know, equip foods does that, um, and they have uh, like an affiliate code with them. If you want to look at that, I haven't sort of used them in a while because I don't use protein shakes because you don't need to. You just eat meat, right? Um, but some people still like to eat protein shakes, or maybe you think that you know this might help you. It might. Meat is better. Meat's a lot better. You don't need products. Um, you just need to sort of figure out how you can logistically get enough meat in, and that's that's the thing. You need to eat multiple times a day. You need to eat high fat. And you need to not drink water within an hour, and uh, and that 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 should be fine. And if you're going to do protein shakes, only get the ones without any additives, flavoring, sweeteners, anything like that. Just the protein. But again, you need all the other things uh, as well as the protein. Okay, guys, um, we have a good turnout. We got like 1,100 people, which is fantastic. It's probably one of the higher turnouts that I've had. So it seems to be a good time uh, to to do these. Um, thanks everyone for joining on. If you are a subscriber, thank you very much. If you're not, please do consider uh, doing that. You know, hit the like button. You know, let me know that you like it. Uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you think as well. If you want more of this sort of content discussions, then um, you know that that uh, lets me know. All right, Terry. Oh, thank you very much, Terry. It's a very generous super chat. Uh, Terry says, "Hi, Dr. Chafee. Can you give a synopsis from your interview with Dr. Sivas?" Uh, as it relates to protein, do you still recommend eating to um, 
fatty meat stops tasting good. Yeah, I do. I think it, and, and I think that, you know, speaking with Dr. Sivas, you know, reinforced that, that you really need high fat. And, you know, I mean, that's something that he's seeing when people are eating more lower fat or they're trying to avoid fat because maybe they have excess fat. He said that doesn't work very well. That actually be harmful and people get very agitated and they get very hungry. There's something called protein sickness or, or um, rabbit starvation where you're just eating really lean meat, really lean meat, and you need the fat. And so you're just eating more and more and more and more and more, and you're getting cranky and upset. And people have died from this. You need the fat. Fat is an essential nutrient. It's essential for life. And there are essential uh, nutrients in, in the fat that you need as well. So really important to eat enough fat. And that just sort of confirmed that. That's something that he has seen. And he, you know, he you know, the guy's in, uh, been in clinical practice for a long time. He's been in this field for a long time. He does, you know, copious amounts of tests on his patients and he tracks these things. You know, he's a, he's a scientist, you know, by training and by virtue. And so he's, he's, um, he's, he tests these things. And as he's been testing these things, as he's been looking into them, he is seeing that people that don't eat enough fat don't have as good of a time and they, they can have other problems. They can, they can actually start getting, um, uh, and get more conversion into blood sugar because you, you, you can't really store protein. You have to store it as fat basically. And, uh, and it, get, it can get converted into um, excess glucose and that can cause a bit of a problem and that gets converted into fat and, and so on. And so um, if you're getting higher urea in your, in your urine tests, in your um, kidney function tests, then that can be a sign that you're not eating enough fat and that you're having to convert more protein into glucose because urea is a byproduct of, of protein metabolism. And so if that's going up, then that, that can mean that, look, you're not eating enough fat and your body has to use protein as a, as a, um, energy source. And so that's not what you want to do. So, yeah, so I, um, it's hard to give a synopsis on a, on a two hour talk. Um, but, but that was it, you know, it really confirmed a lot of things, uh, for me that I had sort of, seen myself that people eating higher fat do really much better. It's really not great to, to uh, limit the fat, even if you have excess fat. In fact, I feel, I find people that have excess fat when they eat as much fat as your body's asking them to, they actually do better and they lose more weight. And again, you can't overeat fat physiologically. It's not, I don't care what anybody tells you. You have bile and bile emulsifies fat. That's how you absorb fat. It is nearly impossible for your body to absorb fat without bile. You can do it, but it's, it's a very small amount. It's mostly medium chain fatty acids. The vast majority of fat, it cannot be uh, absorbed without bile. So when you run out of bile, you have this spillover mechanism. You, you just can't absorb it. You absorb a bit, but the rest of it goes out. And if you eat a lot more fat than your body's going to absorb, you're going to get diarrhea and you're not going to like that. So you're going to want to pull back that fat. Now, could you just eat? buckets of lard and that, you know, four five, six, seven, ten percent 10% of the fat that you're absorbing, you know, without uh, bile. And could that be excess? Sure. You could do that, but you'll have torrential diarrhea. You probably won't be out of the bathroom long enough to eat all that fat and uh, you won't want to continue that. So, you know, it's self-limiting. Uh, fat is self-limiting. So you eat fat until it, you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You eat enough fat that you have soft stools and you're not constipated, but not so much that you have diarrhea and that's it. So that was, um, yeah. So that was, uh, that was good. And he, he, we had a lot of really good takes, you know, he said that, um, you know, there's that, that study from, uh, Harvard I probably have to make this into a, into a short or something like that. Maybe Melissa can, can remind me, remind, uh, um, uh, Mark about this, but where he said that, um, that, that study that, uh, that he said, you know, from Harvard that said, Oh, red meats associated with diabetes it causes diabetes. And he says like, he's like, yeah, yeah, well, that's true. If you look at it from a certain perspective, just like I say that water causes, you know, if you ignore certain things, because just like water, water will cause, um, uh, you know, will cause, uh, you know, liver cirrhosis, as long as you ignore the whiskey, right? <laughs> because there's, there is water in whiskey, water causes a cirrhosis, right? So you saying that, that, you know, yeah, meat causes diabetes. If you ignore the bun and the sugar and the carbs and the, and the, the seed oils and the fries and everything like that, that the meat comes with, um, and that's exactly what Harvard did. I mean, they're, they're just, um, 
you know, they're, they're trying to push a narrative. They're trying to push an agenda, um, which sort of made me wonder, like I was actually considering doing like an MPH, like a master's in public health at Harvard. Um, and, um, obviously that's where, you know, like, you know, Dr. Willett is and, and, uh, the other very, very plant-based people. And I just wonder, I, a, I mean, I don't know if they'd let, let me in the first first place, you know, if they just look me up and see who I am. Yeah, no, not this guy. Or maybe they want me to come in and see if they could, um, you know, a, as an interesting sort of uh, addition, um, because I think very differently than that. Um, you know, I'm also a legacy of Harvard. My my grandparents um, met at Harvard. And um, so maybe that that would help. But um, I, I do wonder if they'd even let me <laughs> let me in the door. Uh, but it would be interesting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but he was showing that, that look, yeah, meat causes diabetes, just like water causes cirrhosis. Um, so we had a lot of very, very interesting quips like that, um, that I, that I really liked. Um, but, uh, but yeah, people want to see that it's, um, it's, a, it's a really good interview. I really liked, uh, liked talking to him. Um, and, uh, yeah, one, one thing that, that, um, you know, he did mention there was that, you know, when we're eating that, that we, maybe we didn't eat all that much fat historically because you know wild animals are lean that's true to an extent but elephants and whales and large larger animals tend to have a, a higher proportion of fat to their body weight and that's why we went after the megafauna we went after the giant giant sloths are just full of fat and things like that there's a lot of these things bears bears you know they have to have a lot of fat they're going to hibernate and so a lot of these 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 ice age animals you know, they needed to have a lot of fat for insulation, for energy, for, you know, the ones that hibernated, um, obviously for those purposes, there actually was a lot of fat available, you know, seals, you know, how much fatter in those whales. So, uh, we, we actually did get a lot of fat and it wasn't until the, the ice ages, uh, last ice age ended and the, this mass extinction of mammoths and, and megafauna that we actually started going over to other sources. We started having, so shoot, we, we're not getting enough fat. We need to cultivate, you know, uh, dairy and get milk and, and make butter out of that. That's, you know, why we did that. We needed more fat. We started, you know, breaking open marrow bones, going after marrow bones that, that happened in a distinct part, you know, place in history, um, prehistory because, you know, we were, the, the megafauna had sort of, were dying out and we didn't have access. We needed more fat. And so we didn't have buzz saws to, cut down the a femur like we do now we get marrow bones you know they had to cook these bake these heat the hell out of them get them till they were hard and cooked and brittle and then smash them open with rocks to get at the fat inside it was labor intensive you know and so it's not um you know we had to work for it so you know that's how important fat was to us and uh you know uh and and and, and like he said too the visceral fat there's a lot of fat around there and, and around the organs and that's and that's what animals tend to go for when they eat another animal they go for the abdomen abdomen first that's where more fat is and that tends to be tends to be why uh quantum truths jck thank you so much for the super chat broke out in highs last week suddenly uh, burning digestive tract, heartburn, costochondritis, UTI, waiting for bloods. I'm now doing the lion diet. Could it be SIBO? Never reacted like this before. Well, you're, you're definitely reacting to something. Um, I don't know what it was. I mean, you could just be unwell, you know, having a UTI and having these other sorts of problems. Costochondritis, is that, is that sort of where is that, that you're, you're feeling that? Is it sort of in the front? Is it in the back? If it's in the back. It actually could be uh, not just a UTI, but, but uh, kidney infection, like a pyelonephritis, which is very painful, you know, in the back, sort of around the lower ribs. Um, so that, that may well be, uh, more, more serious than just a UTI, um, burning digestive tract, heartburn, hives, you're reacting to something. I think going line diet is a, is a fantastic thing to do. Um, it doesn't, it's not jumping out at me as SIBO, but you know, could well be if it's if there is SIBO involved, which you know is very possible. You can have more than one thing going on. Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's the only thing. So um, make sure you're you're seeing your doctor for the UTI. Make sure you're getting checked for like pyelonephritis. If you're having pain in the ribs, especially in the back, that could be actually kidney pain um, and could. Uh, signify like pyelonephritis, which is much more serious. And so you need to be on 
on uh, aggressive antibiotics uh, on, and, uh, and make sure that that's getting treated properly. It's a different course of treatment. It's generally different antibiotics, but it could be the same sometimes depending uh, than, than just a UTI. So UTI, you do a shorter course. Pyelonephritis, you do a longer course. So um, definitely get that checked out. Uh, any concerns, always just go to your doctor and get it checked. Line diet, I think, is, is absolutely the way to go. High fat and then rest. Lots of rest, lots of water, um, meat, as your body is asking you for it, and uh, be in touch with your doctor. Make sure you're on the right antibiotics. Make sure this is not a kidney infection. Um, make sure they they sort of examine you. If they sort of thump you on the back like that, and that's ugh, a lot of pain. You know that might be that might be the the pyelonephritis as opposed to just a UTI. So be mindful of that. Take care of yourself, and um, you know talk to your doctor. Dayron Hernandez, thank you so much for the super chat. Hello, Dr. Anthony. Uh, quick question. I keep hearing that if I don't consume carbs or testosterone tanks, uh, can you please elaborate on this as uh, I'm 40? Uh, dead opposite. Just absolutely dead opposite. When I get people on uh, carnivore diets, their testosterone levels massively increase. Oh, I, have, I have older men in their 60s and 70s that double or triple their testosterone. I get men that are on TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, I get them off. You know, when I have a guy coming into my my clinic and they have very low uh, testosterone, I don't just put them on TRT. I put them on a carnivore diet and then they don't need TRT. I had a 19-year-old kid, 19, 20, uh, you know, nice kid. And he's just sort of, he's sort of going there because his mom made him. Um, but, uh, you know, he had low, low testosterone. And I mean, this guy's like a, like a teenager early, you know, or, or 20, like he, he should have had testosterone screaming out of his ears. Right. But his, his actually very low. It'd be like an 80 year old man. It'd be like low for an 80 year old man. It was, it was low. And so, you know, normal doctors, yeah, you got primary testicular failure. You need to go on testosterone replacement for the rest of your life. Right. Because your, your body's just not making testosterone properly. Uh, I didn't do that. I put him on a carnivore diet in two months. It went from, I think it was around 100s. I think it was like, it was either 120 or 180. Anyway, it jumped up to like 400 in two months. Right. So, and it's still going up. We're testing him again now. I'm, I'm assuming that's going to go up as well, depending on how strict he can stay on it. He's not, he's not being perfect on it, but he's eating a lot more meat and a lot less carbs. And, and he's only eating sort of rice every now and then. Um, just that is already going to improve it. So no, I don't. I don't see that. I've never seen that clinically. People can make all the claims that they want, but in, in actual, uh, you know, real world scenarios, that doesn't happen. Um, if you're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good, and you're lifting weights, and you're reducing stress, and you're optimizing sleep, you're gonna you're gonna improve your testosterone greatly. Um, getting on the sun that was something that uh, Andrew Huberman, Doctor Huberman, was saying that just like 30 minutes exposure with as much skin as possible, you know, shirt off, things like that for guys, um, uh, is, is fairly straightforward. If you're a woman, you have to maybe be in a more private and closed area to get more skin exposure. But, um, if you do that, I think he was saying 30 minutes a day, three days a week, that, that, that can like increase your testosterone alone by like 50%. Vitamin D is a hormone. It's a, it's a sex steroid. Vitamin D is what differentiates out some of the body, body uh, shapes in, in men and women through puberty. So higher vitamin D, it's the vitamin D actually broadens out men's shoulders and narrows the waist. So you have that sort of that V shape, right? That classic bodybuilder V shape with big broad shoulders and narrow skinny waist. That's vitamin D. And then in women, it gives that, that sort of the, the, the the shoulders coming down to a narrow waist and then coming out to uh, a more shapely rounder hip so that that sort of that classical hourglass appearance that's vitamin d that's what vitamin d does in in men and women during puberty um but it affects you after that too so you're not getting in enough you're not getting enough sun you're not getting enough fat um and cholesterol and all these sorts of things you're eating plants and plant sterols which replace our own cholesterol and can't be used for vitamin D, can't be used for testosterone, can't be used for uh, our other hormones like DHEA, pregnenolone, androstene, uh, progesterone, estrogen, all of these things, they're all derived from cholesterol. And so if you're using plant oils, you know, yeah, plant sterols, and that's going to stop you from uh, making enough cholesterol, you're not going to have enough 
cholesterol for your hormones or your vitamin D. So anyway, it all comes in. Uh, in fact, intermittent fasting has been shown to increase growth hormone and testosterone levels by like 50% too. So again, getting that insulin down, your insulin goes up, your testosterone goes down. Think about it like that. In women, it's opposite. Um, the insulin goes up, that blocks the conversion of, in, of testosterone into estrogen in the ovaries. So it stops the ovaries from uh, making estrogen. And so you get too much testosterone, not enough estrogen, and you get you can get PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, like we had the, the, the previous question. The treatment for that is a ketogenic diet. Get off the carbs. This helps your hormones. Get away from plants. Plants have hormone disruptors. They're going to uh, raise your estrogen. They're going to disrupt your testosterone in men especially. So uh, no, you're not going to trash your testosterone. Uh, you're going to feel better than you ever have. You're going to put on muscle even more easily than you ever have. You're going to feel fantastic. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just, just go after it. Um, and you'll, you'll feel great. You'll literally age backwards and you'll feel like a kid again. And you'll just want to just work out and be active and you'll, yeah, just, you, you'll do fine. Don't, don't worry about that. Antonio Crescete. Thank you very much for the super chat. 1.5 months into strict carnivore, had lipids, HDL 45, LDL 197, triglycerides 269. Unusually, unusual high since don't drink, smoke, or eat carbs. Exercise daily. Why? Um, we'll redo tomorrow at 110 days. Yeah, you know, the thing is you just don't worry too much about these things. It matters what the trajectory is. You need data points to see is this going up, is this going down. Stress can also increase your triglycerides. Okay. Poor sleep can also increase your triglycerides. If you exercise daily, that can disrupt your horm your your cholesterol as well. If you exercise the day before or the or the morning of you get uh, your blood test, you will derange your triglycerides. You will derange your HDL and, and LDL. It will change. This is, it's very volatile. It doesn't. It's not consistent. You know, you have to do these things in very specific circumstances, or you'll get massive changes and, and you can't trust them. So you take your blood test first thing in the morning, uh, between eight and 9 AM fasting from the night before 9 PM, only water after that, only water in the morning, no pills, supplements, medications until after your test, no coffee or tea or anything, just water, at least two glasses of water, no more than four glasses of water. And, um, and you, uh, get it tested that way and no stress exercise or sexual activity the morning of or the day before you get your test. This all matters. And then you just get data points. You don't need to test this every couple of weeks. You know, every few months, fine. Um, but you know, if, if your triglycerides are up, it's either you're, you've done something uh, before the test that have sort of deranged things like we talked about. So you want to do a consistent manner to eliminate out those factors anyway from skewing the results. And, um, and then reduce stress, optimize sleep, things like that. If, you know, like I said before, if you, if you get poor sleep, you're getting four or five hours of sleep a night, you're going to get prediabetes in a week and your triglycerides are going to go up. So you need proper sleep, you need uh, proper stress management and, um, and consistent results and you need data points. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Maybe, you know, three months after your last blood test, you check it again. Uh, I don't think you need to get it done, you know, every, every few months or every month, certainly. So, uh, yeah, just take it easy. You know, you just, just work on those things and you'll be fine. Fully laden swallow. Good to see you again, buddy. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Dr. Chafee, would you consider doing a video on listing all the good studies on cholesterol as it relates to cardiovascular disease? Saw your video on the Framingham study on um, Diary of a CEO. I don't think I was on, I wasn't on Diary of a CEO, but, and how it was skewed by the AHA. Would love to learn more. Um, thank you. Well, I have, I have a study, um, or I have a, I have a, uh, an episode that I did is just called The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease. And so I talk about the Framingham study in that. Um, I don't know if that maybe there was a framing up. So it was, it was like a short or something like that. Um, that was in there. I don't, I don't, um, I don't know about the diary of a CEO one because I, I haven't been on that, but, um, maybe there's something in that short or something. I don't, I don't, um, I don't make my shorts. So, you know, maybe someone splice something in there, but the main one that I did on that and, um, 
uh, and I, I go through a lot of studies on this and I have most of them in the description, but not, not all of them. I need to go back, but I always forget unless it comes up like this and then I don't think about it afterwards. Um, but there's a ton of them in there. So I go through a ton of data and a ton of studies in that. So that's called the truth about cholesterol and heart disease. If people want to check that out. All right. Uh, Michelle Kelly, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Dr. C. Are some cancers hereditary? Based on what I'm learning in the carnivore community, it seems that cancers are metabolic disease. Am I understanding that correctly? Dad passed from colon cancer 10 years ago. Thanks. Well, some, some of you have certainly have a genetic predisposition, and then you'll get environmental triggers. So generally, if you don't get the environmental trigger, even though you have a genetic predisposition, and uh, you know, so you know it, that would be considered hereditary. You you can pass down the you know, those, those genes, and there are genes that uh, damage your mitochondria and that make it more easy for your mitochondria to get further damaged and, and have uh, further issues um, relating to cancer. So yes, they can be hereditary, but you still have to, even if you have a genetic predisposition, you still have to have the environmental trigger. Now, you know, people will say, well, what about children that are born with brain tumors? That happens, and that is absolutely devastating. It's absolutely tragic. Um, that is also likely very strong genetic predisposition, again, with environmental trigger. So, you know, would we see those brain tumors in kids, in, in you know, newborn babies, if their mom had been eating a different diet? We don't know. Um, I suspect yes, but we don't know. Um, it could be that, you know, we go on a carnivore diet and someone just has you know, something wrong genetically and they just have this growth and tumor and they're born with that and there's just nothing they could do about it. You know, that's possible. But I think the vast majority of these things, while you can definitely be genetically predisposed to getting cancer through familial inheritance or from a de novo mutation um, in your body, like in your, in your, in, you know, when you're a zygote, um, that 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 you still have to have an environmental trigger for most of these things the vast majority of these things you need the you need the environmental trigger and that's the most important part of that because even if you have the the, the genetic predisposition most often you won't get get the problem if you don't have the environmental trigger so that's what i think is going on uh there but yes you can be predisposed and so if you have a family history of, of cancer you need to be more dialed in and on top of um of your diet and other sorts of things to reduce and minimize your exposures to uh, any cancer causing or cancer facilitating substances. So, and, and I think, I think that's what you're doing. If you do carnivore, I think you are doing, you're addressing a major um, source of that sleep, stress, can't stress, stress enough. It's really important to lower that down. Your body works a lot better when you're de-stressed and uh, sleeping well. So good luck with that. Uh, Nicholas Taylor Poke, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, I'm a redheaded, fair skinned carnivore. I know some people stop getting sunburns on carnivore, at least a lot less. Can you elaborate on this? Will I more than likely have this being fair skinned? Yeah, I know redheads that get tan now, right? Uh, they don't like just freckle up, they actually get, they actually get tan. Um, will that happen with you? I don't know, but that has happened with other people. So, you know, we talk about plant sterols and how they, they mimic cholesterol and we don't make enough cholesterol. So we don't have enough cholesterol to make vitamin D. So we don't synthesize vitamin D. Vitamin D is made on the, well, it's made in the epithelium and also on the surface of your epithelium. And, um, it gets into the sebum and actually works as a, as a UV sunblock. It's a, it's a, it is sunblock. And so when we, when we don't have enough cholesterol or we have a lot of plant sterols getting in the way of cholesterol, we're not going to make vitamin D. And so we're going to get burned, right? We're going to get uh, sun damage. If you wear sunglasses with UV protection, your brain doesn't think that your the brain thinks you're in a cave. And so you're not, it's not getting uh, enough light. It's not getting UV light. It thinks you're not outside and you're not going to produce as much melanin. You're not going to produce as much um, uh, vitamin D. So uh, that can be a problem too. And then, you know, when you're when you're eating plants, they come with the plant sterols, which you know, we just talked about. But they also come with inflammatory factors, cause more inflammation. So if you get damage, it will cause more inflammation, more oxidative stress, more damage, and you'll get 
damage, you get more burned and you'll peel. And then they also come with different substances, different classes of toxins that make you more photosensitive, make you more light sensitive, UV sensitive. Um, uh, so there's a whole class of them called ferranocoumarins. I just did a, I just did a story on, uh, on my Instagram showing this it's called celery dermatitis, kids chewing on celery and the spit goes down their face and they get chemical burns in the sun because those ferranocoumarins burn their skin in the sun when exposed to UV light outside of the UV light it doesn't do that. Um, but it gets in your body and your body's detoxifying this and you can get more light sensitive as well. So you're not eating those things and you're not going to be as light sensitive. Um, animals do this. Livestock does it. They get into uh, feed or plants that they are not supposed to because they run out of their normal food and they don't have feed. They'll eat what they have to to survive. And some of these things will just get scorched and burned and horribly, um, horribly uh, hurt by this. We do that too. So you're eating a whole bunch of plants and garbage, you know, celery, parsnips, uh, citrus, all citrus have ferranocoumarins that make you light sensitive. So, you know, uh, kids, um, there's a, there's a picture of a kid I put on there too. He's squeezing limes out in the sun, lime juice dripping down his arm. He got second degree chemical burns down his arms, but yeah, but, but, but the plant toxins are good for you, aren't they? So, you know, this is, this is how plants defend themselves. And so that's a major thing. When you cut out all of those things out of your diet and out of your system, uh, your body just works differently. I have, I've have not worn sunscreen in Australia. Um, and people say, oh, the sun's different here. Not where I'm coming from, you know. I don't burn. You get red, but that turns into a tan. I don't. I don't peel, and it doesn't hurt. I can take a hot shower looking red, and the next day it just looks brown. So uh, that that can happen with you as well. Obviously, it's um, you can overdo it. Um, I, I've really, really overdone it, and just been in the sun just all day, every day for a day and days and days and days and days in the middle of the summer. You know, it's 110 degrees out. And um, loved it, and it's turned into a tan, and I and it had a little bit of peeling on my nose. That was it, a little bit on my shoulder. That was it. it. wasn't like huge amounts, just little tiny spots, and that was it. And I really overdid it. So you know, being fair skin, you know, you're probably not going to be as able to <laughs> be as aggressive as I am, uh, but um, no, you, you you'll probably tan. I don't think you'll you'll burn much at all. But uh, you know, ease into it. I think you'll be fine. Um, you don't need sunscreen. Sunscreen. Uh, has benzene and things like that that are known carcinogens. So I don't think you need to, to take those sorts of things. Just be smart about it. Uh, ease into it. See how you go. And um, if you're doing just meat and water, I think you'll be fine. Gordon Smith. Hey, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate that. Um, from Lena, thank you for the super chat. If you do OMAD and later on feel fine, not hungry but not full, do you eat some meat? anyways um and it tastes good does it mean that you should eat more yes if it tastes good you should eat more it means you're hungry so remember your hunger signals are going to change they're, they're very different on a carnivore diet they're appropriate on a carnivore diet when you're not eating carnivore diet and you eat a whole bunch of other garbage you will inappropriately increase your hunger signals and so you'll just be starving all the time so you have to limit yourself you said well i could eat i want to eat but i don't need to eat i'll i'll, I'll forego um you don't want to do that on a carnivore diet. You want to eat until fatty meat stops tasting good. And so if you eat once and you do that and you get to a point where fatty meat stops tasting good and you stop, that's great. And if later on you feel like, yeah, I could eat steak sounds good. And you start eating, you're like, yeah, that tastes delicious. Your body wants that food. Keep eating until it stops tasting good. Yeah, absolutely. Joe Fry Guitar Guy um, says, is it true we get all the nutrients we need for life from only meat? Yeah, absolutely. We get everything you need in the proportion that you need it for eating meat. And how do we know this? Well, um, because we exist and we had to make it our way through ice ages and those ice ages did not have plants abundantly available. We were eating meat and in people in the Northern reaches during the ice ages, they really <laughs> didn't have any plants to eat. So, you know, they, uh, and then the Inuit, up in the Arctic Circle, there are no plants up there. They're above the tree line. There's nothing growing up there except like deep down in the depths of the ocean, like plankton and things like that. Um, you know, I don't even know if seaweed is there. It's just so, so deep there. But, um, you know, they don't eat plants. And uh, and they, they're very healthy. They're just eating fatty meat. Polar explorers that went up north, when they only ate meat, 
they did better than if they packed in their food. If they were just hunting and eating fatty meat the way the Inuit did, that's when they they did the best. Um, so yeah, you absolutely do get everything you need in the proportion that you need it if you're only eating meat. If you're eating a mixed diet, you need a different constellation of nutrients and that can change. You say, oh, you need this much and this much. When we were figuring that out, um, we were we were all eating a mixed diet. And so, you know, it's different, you know, you get anti-nutrients, you get things in plants that delay, stop, um, and prevent you from absorbing and utilizing nutrients properly. You're going to need an abundance of other nutrients in order to overwhelm that when you're not eating those plants, you don't, you don't need them. So yes, we absolutely do. Um, if ever, if ever, ever you hear anyone say like, oh, well, we weren't in the ice ages, we weren't living up in the ice. Well, the Inuit or... And, um, you know, I say, well, we were just racing down towards the equator and we just stayed there eating fruits because we're frugivores. Somehow, somehow people think that with their brain that they somehow think works. So that's not true. They're just making that up. The fossil record actually shows that Homo habilis, when the ice sheets were coming down on the, the start of the first ice age, they migrated up into the ice, right? Away from the equator. They went into the tundra and the frozen frozen Arctic areas because that's where the megafauna was, presumably. But anyway, that's where that's where they went. And so they they survived because they went to a meat-only diet, because they manifested their destiny as apex predators. And that's where our evolution took off. Our height and brain size went up exponentially, faster than basically any other um, advancement in brain size and height that uh, I know of anyway. Um, it's uh, and certainly in our in our evolutionary history, that, that was the fact it was sort of going up and up and as we, as we were eating more meat, we were sort of going up like this. And then it hit Homo habilis in the ice ages and we became apex predators and bam, just took off. And then 10, 15,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture, brain size going up, 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 down. Height going up, 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 down. So, you know, not what you want. But yeah, you get absolutely everything you need. What what are the Inuits eating? They don't have access to anything. In the last ice age, when the when the Bering Strait became a land bridge between Asia and North America, and people could walk across, that's in the Arctic Circle. And well, it's close enough anyway if it's not in it. But it's you know completely iced over. That was the whole point. It's just the 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 sea levels went down, 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 down. And um and uncovered this just this ice bridge that went across from Asia to North America. And that's how people came across during the last ice age. Why, you know, why were they able to survive if they they were able to, you know, when they came across it, there was no plants there. What were they eating? It was animals. That's it. That's all you're eating during that time in those areas. So yeah, you get everything you need in the proportion that you need it. And you don't get all the other things that you don't want because meat doesn't come with toxins. Plants do. And that's the main thing. Any animal can eat meat. Any animal can thrive on meat. Only certain animals can thrive on certain plants because they have the, the biological ability to detoxify and gain the nutrients from that specific plant, which are locked up in ways that we don't have access to. They lock up their nutrients in a lot of ways and they, and they guard them with toxins. So that's, that's, uh, that's the idea there. Lonnie Callies, thank you so much for the super chat. I have IgA nephropathy, uh, been carnivore for about 11 months. Got blood work at four months and kidney disease was in remission. Hey, fantastic. That's great. Uh, kidney doctor shocked when I told him my diet. Uh, chance I'll heal 100% from carnivore. Well, I hope so. You know, the thing is, is there there is such a thing as damage done and you can have permanent damage. You know, we see this in, in other sort of organ uh, maladies such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If the the... Uh, antibodies attack the the thyroid and damage them permanently. You can lower and remove the 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 antibodies by putting someone on a pure lion diet, high fat red meat diet. Antibodies come right down. I see these things in the thousands, and they just and if they stick with it, that go they go to undetectable eventually. It can take a while. Hashimoto's is a bit stubborn, but but then the the body is now trying to heal the thyroid if it's too damaged. It's not going to ever work at full capacity again. They might need to be on uh, thyroid medication uh, a bit, maybe not, but they'll be on less and less and less and less and less. 
and but they may still need to be on a little bit to be optimal. So it could be the same way. It could be that your 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 kidneys were damaged to a point that they can only recover to a point, but 100% carnivore, 100% lion diet is going to allow your kidneys to heal as much as they will ever be able to. Nothing else is going to be able to do that than I know of. Um, and so that's great. Um, I'd be really interested to see what your, your shocked kidney doctor said when you told him that and you know what they thought. Because some people just go like, yeah, couldn't have been that. We don't know what it is. But if people have, have a bit of insight, they'll say like, holy crap, I need to rethink this. And those are the good doctors. Those are the ones that that really want to do something, do the right thing for their patients and the and the right things uh, in their treatments. Um, so hopefully your doctor is that kind of person. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing. We're told that meat and protein is bad for your kidneys. It's not. You know, the studies actually show that higher protein diets improve kidney function. It doesn't make it worse. So that's great. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, hopefully your doctor was open-minded to want to learn more. And maybe look into those studies that actually show protein does better and that there's nephrotoxic chemicals uh, like oxalates in plants. And so you avoid the nephrotoxic things and you bring on all the nutrients your body needs to run your kidneys and work properly and you do better. And, uh, and you get rid of a lot of these inflammatory diseases, certainly autoimmune diseases, and you just get better. So congratulations on that. I'm really happy to hear that. Keep it up. Hopefully your kidneys get back to completely normal function and hopefully your doctor uh, starts thinking about this and looking into it and, um, and, and suggesting this to his patients because he will cure a lot of his patients by doing this. And he'll certainly help all of them if he does. So awesome. Uh, Gary Kramer says on your recommendation, I quit coffee January 31st, 2024. And I used to drink six cups a day. Good job. Uh, hopefully you feel a lot better. I certainly feel much better when I don't drink coffee. Not that I was ever a big coffee drinker. Um, and, but a lot of people do, a lot of people say that I've, I've come across one guy who just said, look, I went a month without coffee. Didn't feel too much different. Added back in, didn't feel worse. So I'm just going to do it. Fair enough. Um, most people don't have that. Most people feel, uh, a lot less sore. They don't have the same inflammation. They have better, more stable, um, uh, energy levels. And I certainly feel that way too. Um, so hopefully you're in that camp too. One, one, um, guy I know, you know, does a lot of running and training and he said that he went full carnivore, but he dropped coffee at the same time. And he's like, it was really hard because he's like, he really wanted that caffeine for his workout. So it was hard to get through that. But after a month he was, he was doing great, but he was just like, I wish I'd sort of split it up and did carnivore first and then drop coffee. So I wasn't sort of doing both at the same time and sort of converting into ketosis and, and getting keto adapted and not had my coffee. So it can be a, it can be a bit of a struggle, but you do get there eventually and it, and it does get better. So good job. And a question, is that a real sword? It is a real sword. Yeah. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a, a replica of a, uh, Shogun, um, Katana from, I think the 15th century. And it was made at the, uh, at the, um, the, uh, the Tokyo, um, samurai museum. So they do, they do these sort of replicas and, um, yeah, so it's really, really nice. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a really cool sword. It's a, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, question from UN. Thank you for the super chat. 48 year old female BMI 21 blood pressure, 96 over 60 HDL 98 triglycerides, 68 LDL 123, uh, low carb, high fat, mostly meat diet. Got a CAC score of 330, referred to a cardiologist. What do I ask? Uh, and I'm worried. Well, look, that's, that's fair enough to be worried. A CAC score over 100 is, is sort of where you start getting worried. What was it last year? What was it the year before that? And the year before that? And the year before that? You, know, you need to know these things. What's it going to be next year? What's it going to be the year after that? And the year after that? And the year after that? That's what's important. You need data points. Um, they'll probably say you have a CAC score of 330. You need to be on a stat and you're very high risk. The question to ask is, so you're putting me on a statin for a high CAC score, yes. So does that mean that a statin will lower my CAC score? The answer to that is no. It actually raises the CAC score. And they say, well, that's good because it's stabilizing the plaque and that makes it less likely to rupture. Okay, but a CAC score says nothing about the soft plaque. You could have a lot of soft plaque or not a lot of soft plaque. So. 
Raising your CAC score, is that necessarily a good thing? Not necessarily. Is it necessarily a bad thing? Well, according to them, if you're on statins, then it's not a bad thing because you're stabilizing your plaques, which sort of seems a bit off to me. That's a, that, Those are two sort of mutually exclusive ideas. If your CAC score is up, so that means you need to be put on a statin, which makes it go up even more. Are we thinking about this? So that's a question I would ask. Um, your triglycerides look great. Your HDL looks great. Your LDL looks great. Um, CAC score, we don't know what that was before. You need to remember that. And that doesn't tell you what the soft plaque is. If you have soft plaque that's going down, your CAC score can actually be going up because the, the plaque there that's 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 still around can still be getting calcified. And according to them, getting stable and, and less likely to rupture. So isn't that good? But if the soft plaque is going down, your CAC score is going up a bit just because it's sort of calcifying a bit of this stuff. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Women that take calcium supplements have a 15% increased risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease. That's something to think about. You know, So maybe if you're on a calcium supplement and you've got calcium in your arteries, maybe that's not what you want to do. Um, maybe statins aren't what you want to do because LDL was never a problem in the first place. Cholesterol was never a cause of heart disease. It was a scapegoat by the sugar companies and it raises your CAC score. So CAC score, if that's the problem, why are we trying to raise it? Why are we taking medications that raise it? So those are the questions that I would ask. Those are the things that I would think about. And I would just, me personally, I would just get successive CAC scores. Check it in a year, check it in two years, get an angiogram. If you want to know what's actually going on in your heart, if you want to know what's actually going on with the blockages, how much obstruction you have, then you get an actual scan that can visualize both the hard plaque and the soft plaque. So you look at total occlusion. If any, you can have a CAC score without you know uh, any significant occlusion. And then you check that and you check it again in a year, right? And then you see what's going on there and you reduce stress and you improve sleep. Major, major, major killers, poor sleep uh, and high stress. Um, the only study that's been shown to clinically reverse atherosclerosis was a study on uh, meditation. When you meditate for 40 minutes a day or people who meditated for 40 minutes a day actually clinically reversed their atherosclerotic plaques. So do that too uh, and get more data points. We don't know what your CSC score was before. So all you can do is start where you're at now. You know, you need to get on a plan that you think is going to be best for your heart, that's going to be best for your health. For me, that's a 100% meat and water diet. That's what I do for my health. And that's what I think the data shows is the right thing to do. But you need to be, you need to be convinced. You don't just do things just because I do them or someone else does them. Look at my, my video on the truth about cholesterol and heart disease. Talk to your cardiologist. Talk to other people. Look at other videos that have differing views. And then see what you think holds the most merit and then make a decision for you. Because at the end of the day, this is this is only going to affect you and your family. And so you need to you need to make the right decision for you. Right. You, you can't don't let people uh, make decisions in your life that pay no consequence for being wrong. If your cardiologist says you have to do this and you think that that's a really bad idea, if you have a, a bad outcome from that. It's you that suffers. It's not the doctor. And if the doctor is following the guidelines, he can't even sue him, right? <laughs> because, he's, you know, he's just, well, I'm just doing what we're told to do. That's what everyone, that's the, that's the standard of care. You can't get sued for doing standard of care, right? And, um, and so that's why a lot of doctors hide behind standard of care. But it's also the standard of care. That's what most people do. That's a consensus. Say like, hey, this is what most people think most people should do. But, you know, those those guidelines come from not exactly trusted sources sometimes, often. Uh, even the, the editor-in-chief of the um, New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet have both said that you can't trust these uh, expert opinion or uh, guidelines or even the studies published in The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine that they're all corrupted um, by industry mostly, you know, and special interests. So um, you got you have to know you have to do what's right for you. You know, if you, if you look, if you see what your doctor says and you say, like, I, I think I need to go with him, then don't worry about what I say, you know, because if I'm wrong, you're the one getting hurt. 
I'm getting hurt too because I'm doing this, but you know, I don't think it is. I don't, I, and, and that's why I do this. And that's why I recommend this to patients. And that's why I have my, my, I recommend to my parents, you know, that's a tough one. You know, when you're looking at this going like my, I need to be damn sure, you know, that this isn't going to hurt my parents because, you know, I, I just, I love them to death and I would never want them to hurt. I want them to be as healthy and happy as they can be for the, for a very long time. And so, you know, this is something that I've, I've put a lot of thought and effort into because I don't want to hurt my parents and I don't want to hurt any of you. So this is the conclusion that I've come to, but if I'm wrong, you're the one getting hurt. So you need to decide what's right for you. So you need to listen to other people. Don't just listen to me. Don't just be in an echo chamber. Listen to Gundry. Listen to Gregor, if you can stand his voice. And you know, listen to me. Listen to Ken Berry. Listen to Dr. Avadia, uh, cardiac, th uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, um, you know, and talk to your cardiologist. And then take all that information and you come up with a plan for your health because it is your health. It's no one else's health. It's only going to affect you. And so you need to be on a plan that you think is the right thing to do. But that's what I would recommend. I would recommend doing exactly what you're doing, eating a high fat meat based diet because saturated fat and the journal American college of cardiology has said in 2020, with massive meta analyses of randomized controlled trials and meta analyses of randomized controlled trials showing that there is no correlation between dietary saturated fat intake and cardiovascular disease. None. Right. And higher saturated fat actually correlates with lower risk of stroke and less saturated fat, higher risk of stroke. So that's what the data shows. That's what the evidence shows. And the history shows that cholesterol was never the problem in the first place. This was invented by the sugar companies. And then they found unscrupulous doctors and researchers that they could pay off to push that narrative. It was bullshit. Then it's bullshit now. And statins raise your CAC score. So those are the questions I'd ask. Those are the things I think about. And I would watch um, the truth about cholesterol and heart disease on my YouTube channel. And I would watch my interview with Dr. Philip Avadia, who's a cardio, cardiothoracic surgeon, who is of the same opinion as I am. And, um, and then look at the alternative side and then talk to your cardiologist and come up with a plan for yourself. And good luck with that. Uh, trust no one. Uh, thank you for the super chat. I have gastroesophageal reflux disease. I've been on carnivore for six days and it's really starting to get to my stomach now. Um, should I keep going? Is it possible for me? Yeah, you, you definitely can. You know, if you have, you know, if you have reflux or you have uh, gastritis and you may need to be on like a, a PPI, like a proton pump inhibitor or something to just calm things down so that your gut can heal as so you can give it a chance to heal. But when you're on a carnivore diet or even any ketogenic diet that actually can improve gastro, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, it can improve the, the inherent protections that your stomach has against its own acid that it makes, which is what it's designed to do. Um, and so that can actually often resolve and actually improve. So, uh, hopefully that does, I would definitely stick with it. If you need some, you know, some non-sweetened Tums or a PPI for a month, fine. I don't, I, I think that these medications can actually be very helpful in certain situations like this. So, uh, don't, uh, don't just say like, mm, no, I'm only doing it supernatural. You can, you know, but, um, it's just going to be a bit more of a pain in the ass. And, um, you know, a short course of a PPI is not going to do all that much harm that I know of. Um, you know, and if, if it keeps being a problem, you know, you might want to think about getting, you know, a scope and look in and see if you have like an ulcer or something else that's going on that you might need a bit more treatment with as well. So, uh, that's what I would do. Tyler, a wise guy. Thank you so much for the super chat. Can the carnivore diet help someone with diabetes? Oh God. Yes. Yes. 100% yes. Uh, how long do the withdrawals last on carnivore diet? Do electrolytes help? Electrolytes can help, especially if you're getting a bit dizzy or lightheaded and you're just sort of not feeling good energy or something like that. Try electrolytes. Only get the ones that don't have um, uh, artificial sweeteners or any sweeteners or, um, uh, or flavorings, just the straight up electrolytes. So... Um, yeah, that's what I would do. So, so you just, you, you don't necessarily need them, but, uh, some do. And, um, and, uh, and if they make you feel better then great, just don't get it with any sort of flavorings or sweeteners or anything like that. Uh, withdrawals, uh, for carbs and sugar generally last about two weeks 
and then they're done. But they they sort of worse at first, and then they start getting better and better and better. And after two weeks, you generally don't uh, miss them. And um, and if you if you eat more fatty meat, if you just look at that and say, okay, I'm hung, uh, you know, I'm having carb cravings. That's probably hunger I should eat. Keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. It usually goes away, or at least si- significantly reduces your cravings. Um, and can car- carnivore help with diabetes? Yeah, it reverses it. I mean, that's just shown in clinical trials that high fat ke- meat based ketogenic diets, especially when you remove seed oils, reverse type two diabetes and and significantly stabilize type one diabetes, so that you don't require nearly as much insulin, and um, it's much 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 more stable and manageable. So yes. Uh, Jay Click, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, my twin and I started the carnivore diet in January 24. She has sleep apnea, uh, asthma, COPD, and takes meds. Fibromyalgia, um, it, t- it looks like carnivore diet healed her heart and her edema since she started. Uh, she's lost 23 pounds. Oh, that's amazing. And it's only, it's, it's still early days. You know, it's only been a couple months. Um, sleep apnea, asthma, COPD, and fibromyalgia, I mean, those things, I've, I've certainly the sleep apnea, asthma, fibromyalgia, weight, massively improved. I'm seeing more and more people with uh, COPD uh, from smoking, things like that, emphysema, that, that have actually started improving. Now, it's going to be like cirrhosis of the liver or something else. There is going to be permanent damage. You're not going to heal that permanent damage. But the part that's still viable, the good tissue is going to work better. And so symptomatically and actually um, objectively, you can get improvement from that. Um, and so that that's great. And I'm seeing more and more people with COPD uh, uh, improve on that as well, which is which is really, really good. Um, and yeah, so and as it, it says down below, uh, you know, please do comment and like and share this if you if you think this is helpful and if these are useful. And if you guys like these sorts of things, it helps YouTube tell this to more people uh, that may like it as well. And it tells me that you guys like me doing this and I'll try to do more of them as well. Um, also, I will be putting out my, my my fuller version of my response to Lane Norton's uh, little reel uh, about me. Um and uh, which I which I thought was a bit amusing. Uh, I'll be doing that tomorrow, sort of same ish time as today. So in the morning, um, and uh, and I'll put that out. And I just had some sort of um, uh, some technical issues with it, so I wasn't able to put it out yesterday. But I'll be putting that out tomorrow. I'll be putting it out as a premiere um, at probably nine a.m. Uh, Perth time, which would be five p.m. Pacific time in America and uh, 8 p.m. in the East Coast in America. And so if people can join that for the premiere, it, it really helps drive it up and um, you know, hit like and comment and share and all that sort of stuff, really helps drive this up and get that out there. And it's it's important, it's important to to point this stuff out because you know he's using, you know, he's using false claims and he's cherry picking out, taking things out of context, um, not giving the whole argument. Then he's um, you know, citing studies that are completely irrelevant to the discussion at hand and pretending that there are these randomized controlled trials, robust, this, that, and the other. And he just, he just assumes that no one's going to check them. And uh, so I checked them and they they were completely irrelevant. And in fact, some of them actually proved my point, which is very funny to me because uh, he said, this proves that, you know, plant toxins are good for you. Uh, and actually some of the studies actually showed that they cause more harm. So, which was funny. So he, he didn't even, didn't even read his own study. So if people can join for that, uh, that would be great. And that would be a premiere and, and I'll be there chatting with people in the live text chat as well. And you guys can just let me know what you think and, uh, hopefully you like it. But, um, I think it's important to start pushing back on these people that are making these erroneous claims and, and using studies that have no bearing on the the conversation at hand and trying to say that other people are being dishonest and zealots and ideologically driven when it actually is more likely him you know he says like this is what he thinks nothing's going to shake it because he's right and he couldn't possibly be wrong you know i even saw him uh <laughs> he did a thing with thomas de Lauer, who was so nice to to even have a conversation with this guy because he'd been so rude to thomas before and um and uh and he was really nice to him. And Lane says, like, oh, well, you know, um, and, you know, and, and, he, and you, you admit it, too. He's like, oh, yeah, Thomas was so nice, even though I was really not nice, you know. So at least he has some sort of insight into that 
sometimes, but then he still acts badly, you know, a lot of the time and will cuss people out and tell me it like an eye doctor or something like that. Said, oh, what, what about this and this? And he said, you're an eye doctor, F off or shut the F up. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? You know, and so it's, um, you know, he acts like that. And, and at least sometimes he gets that that's inappropriate, but um, he, he still does it, which is bad. Uh, but with Thomas, he said like, oh, well, you know, I said, you know, I was maybe not as nice as I could have been. And he was always nice. So we're going to do this. But also, you know, he's come around. He's really he's really matured and really, you know, come around on his thinking on a lot of things, basically meaning that he is so rigid in his thought that no one is going to be right unless they agree with him. And so the reason that he's that 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 um, that Thomas was uh, doing better now was because he came around to Lane's thinking. Therefore, it's OK. So that's that's zealotry. You know, that's ideologically driven. That's being so rigid in your thought that you can't think anything else. I was taught this stuff, too. I was taught a lot more than he was. And I was and I've, I've had to look back and go, wow, that was all wrong. So I was not ideologically driven. Like I, I'm, before I was a doctor, I was an empiricist. And so I just I want to know the facts and um, and the data. So, you know, a lot of things in medicine are like that. Like I, I you know, uh, there's a Harvard there's a Harvard graduation address where they said that um, they said to the students who graduating class, they said, Hey, look, 50% of the 50% of the things that, or half of the things that you've learned here in Harvard are going to turn out to be wrong, but no one's going to tell you which half. And so you need to figure that out and you need to experiment. You need to test, you need to research yourself to find out which half and what's right and what's wrong. And you don't just take all these things at face value. Well, that's what I learned. So that's true. Um, so it's um oh, sorry it's um you know it's important to remember that and, and you just just because you learned something in college and just because you read a study on it doesn't actually mean that that's true you need to keep an open mind on things and the reason that i think the things that i do now is is because of that i radically changed my view on things because that's where the evidence led you know i, I wasn't born with this and, oh it has to be this this is like i was like looking at more and more and more i'm like oh my god this just this just blew my mind so that's the thing and it's i think it's important for us to point these things out and get more and more people on board um pushing back on him because he just shouts people down and just yells at them and so we need to we need to push back and we need to be more aggressive in our defense and uh and and calling him out and holding him to task to be more um to be more appropriate and to be more rigorous with his argument and stop being so um, stop being so rigid in his thinking. So that will come out tomorrow. Hopefully people enjoying for the, the premiere. If we can get this sort of turnout tomorrow uh, for the premiere, that would be amazing. Hopefully we can. Please do if you're able to. Uh, Muhammad, thank you so much for the super chat. How to gain muscle on carnivore um, on a and fix skinny fat. So the skinny fat will uh, will try, will, will sort of fix itself, you know, if you're just not eating carbs and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, and so that will sort of sort, of, sort of itself out, you know, the, the skinny fat, the visceral fat, those will just sort of melt away and, uh, and, and fix your metabolism. Um, um, and, um, then the muscle side of things, that's that's sort of more. You just need to eat more. So you need to stimulate your muscle growth. You need to lift weights. You need to sprint. And you work maximally. You need to push yourself, right? You need to go to muscle fatigue. And then you need to do this regularly and consistently. You can't just work out for two weeks and go, ah, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not going to the Olympia. So, you know, that's it. You need to be consistent. You need to go. You need to work out. You know, you need Set it, set it out three days a week, four days a week. You pick certain days and you go come hell or high water. You work out. Um, you got a home gym system or you have like the X three bar or something like that. You have it. You just do it right. You don't mess around. So, um, that's, that's important to do that consistency. So you need to lift weights. You need to work maximally. You need to be consistent. You need to sprint maximally. And then you just eat. You need to eat enough and you need to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. If you're working out a lot, at least try it twice a day. And if you get enough meat, if you get enough fat um, and you get enough food and you work out like that, you will put on muscle more easily than you ever have in your entire life. 
Now, some people, are, it's easier for them to put on muscle than others. Um, but it, either way, for you, it'll be the easiest that you've ever put on muscle. But you got to eat enough. You got to keep eating until it stops tasting good. That's different than just eating until you feel full or feel like you could stop. It's diff two different things. You eat until it stops tasting good. And you work out, and that's it. That's what you do. Um, so we had a question here as well. Um, but there's what there's a question that seems to, to pop up and, and, and um, that I've got here in the chat that says, do you have any plans to expand your practice to include nutritional therapy similar to Rivero? So I basically do that now, you know, my functional medicine practice, that's a major part of my practice is, is, is diet and, uh, diet and lifestyle sort of interventions. That's like 95% of the treatment that we have medications and things like that, that we can fill in the gaps and, you know, uh, uh, band-aid issues, but the major underlying driver is, is the diet. So if I have someone that comes in they're in, they have hypothyroidism, they're uh, Hashimoto's and they're having these other sort of issues, you know, you know, yes, you know, they, they need to be on thyroid medication. If they're below a certain level and they're not well, then they need to be on thyroid medication. So you put them on thyroid medication, but you also address the diet, which is going to address the underlying condition. So then you see if you even need to stay, stay on, on medications, oftentimes you can bring them down or you can take them off. And you don't need to keep as long as they're able to stay on top of the diet, especially on a, on a just a red meat and water diet. And so that's the thing. So you can use other uh, traditional uh, medicines and medications as an adjunct. You know, someone comes into me and has diabetes, like I'm fine with them being on metformin. I'm not fine with them being on Ozempic. I, you know, but you fix the diet and then, then that fix the underlying condition and then they can come off the medications. So you know, that's, um, I already do that now, but you know, I, I really like Rivero. And, you know, if I, if I go, if, and when I go back to the States, you know, uh, depending on what I'm doing, I'll, I'll probably try to involve myself in Rivero because I really like, uh, Dr. Baker. He's, he's a great guy and he, and he really means well. And he's a, you know, I, I consider him a, you know, a friend of mine and I, I want that model to succeed where we're, we're just helping people and treating root cause um, sort of issues. So I do, I do do that, um, in my practice. Um, and, um, you know, even, you know, when I finish up neurosurgery, like I'm, this is, that's going to be part of it. I'm going to talk to people about this and be like, Hey, you have all this pain, you have all this thing. Have you tried these dietary interventions? Like, yeah, we can do surgery, but you need to be on this diet leading up to that. So you can have a best outcome. Right. And if they come back and say, Hey, um, my pain's gone. I don't think I really need this anymore. Great. I don't care if I don't make money from those surgeries. Like there's enough people that need surgery. There's a enough money in the world. I don't care. You know, I just want, I want the right thing for people. I don't want to have to carve into someone's spine unless they have to. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that that's a really important thing. I think all doctors should incorporate uh, nutritional therapy in, into their practices. And if they're not, I think that's honestly borderline malpractice. Like you're not, you're not, addressing the underlying thing. You're not doing something that can help them. Um, it was actually really interesting. There's a patient who made a very good point. He had a friend of his that's an orthopedic surgeon and uh, said, well, would you do diet? Like, oh, no, no, we don't do that. We just do the medicine and all that sort of stuff. You know, that's just, we're not allowed to give dietary advice or all that sort of stuff. First of all, you are actually, and you know, it's sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, you're supposed to, too. You know, I mean, a, a lot of doctors, oh, don't, don't eat fat, don't eat red meat because of cancer. That's dietary advice, right? Just the wrong dietary advice. But, um, you know, he said, oh, we're not allowed to give dietary. Now you are actually because Dr. Gary Fetke he got attacked and the dietitian said, you're not allowed to give dietary advice. You're just a doctor. Doctors treat health and diet and nutrition is part of health. And he was reversing diabetes. And so people didn't have to get their legs chopped off. And um, and they're then they're trying to take him to court over that. And they did take him to court, but he won. And of course, I've, of course, you can give dietary advice. Of course, you need them to drink. You're a doctor. That's part of being healthy. And so, of course, you can do that if that's if that's helpful. So, um, you can give dietary advice. This over three said, "Well, no, no, we don't do that." And, and the my patient said to him, "Was like, well, you know, aren't there certain foods that interfere with certain medications? Like, wouldn't you wouldn't you tell them not to eat certain things if it interfered with the medication?" Oh, well, yeah, of course. But that's that's different because that's that's medical. It's like, how do you know that they're eating that? If you don't ask them, 
if you don't ask about their diet and their nutrition, how do you know if there's going to be a, a conflict or not? Right. It's a good point. And, um, and, uh, you know, probably, you know, made him think and hopefully did. Okay. Carnivore Chronicles. Thank you very much for the super chat. Um, just looking here. I have a friend who has a functional neurological disorder, which caused a distended stomach, loss of speech, seizures, and he's had urosepsis eight times. Could the carnivore diet possibly help? That's a good question. Um, functional neurological disorder, the word functional means it, it doesn't have an organic cause that we know of, meaning that we we don't, like if you have, if you have epilepsy, there's something going wrong in your brain and you're having misfiring and electrical signals that are shutting down your brain and you're having a seizure. If you have functional seizures, that means that that's not happening, but you're doing that anyway. You're, you're shaking, you can't move, or you're having some sort of twitches or whatever, but it seems to be something that's not organic, meaning that it's not actually from a derangement of the electricity in your brain. So does that mean they're making it up? Or does that mean that there's some sort of psychological pressure and stress that's causing them to affect that physical, those physical manifestations in their body, the psychosomatic sort of relationship? Don't know. We don't know. Um, it's very hard to say. Um, I, I, you know, I think the people that have these sorts of things certainly aren't making it up necessarily. I mean, there are people that make these things up. It's like Munchausen's disease or Munchausen's by proxy, the people that are sort of faking it and, and, um, and because they, they like the attention and there's, there's a psychological gratification that they get from being sick and having people dote on them. But with, with FND, you know, that's not necessarily the case and it probably isn't in most cases, but, um, that doesn't mean that there's an organic cause. And so, you know, can you remove, you know, uh, you know removing certain foods and things like that, um, isn't necessarily going to help with that unless you think about it from the sense of psychological, psychiatric sort of issues, which carnivore diets and ketogenic diets actually really help a lot. And so if you're thinking of it from a, from a mental health point of view, um, it could very well be that FND responds similar to major depression or ADHD or, or schizophrenia or different personality disorders that, that you're just a bit you know, you know, on edge or there's something going on psychologically and psychiatrically that, that the diet can help with. And so potentially with that, now I haven't seen too many people with FND go on a carnivore diet. So I can't really tell you from experience what, what I've, what I've seen, but, um, it's rare enough that, you know, probably not going to get too many, many examples of this, but you never know. I mean, there's a lot of people on this live has anyone dealt with this? Has anybody had FND or had a family member or friend with FND, uh, functional neurological disorder that that has helped with this? You know, if this is good to talk, ask the community and ask these questions and see what people's experiences are. Please say that in the chat. Please make uh, say that in the comments. Let people know. Also, it's going to improve her health no matter what you do, right? So you can have FND. And you can have all these other sorts of problems, but if you go, and it may be that a carnivore diet doesn't cure that, but what it can do is it can help their health in a lot of other ways that make it a hell of a lot easier to deal with the FND than it would otherwise. But I, I have a suspicion that it would help, but you know, that remains to be seen. It's just some of these things are still trial and error. It's not going to hurt her. It's certainly safe, but you know, it's, um, it's, you know, it's something that just remains to be seen and hopefully they do better with it and uh, their health is going to improve either way. But, uh, yeah, if anyone else has, has more experience with that, please do comment and, and let us know. Pure blooded Patriot. Thank you for the super chat. Do you agree with your last guest regarding, uh, needing carbs? Oh, for, for Dr. Sybis. So he, he wasn't really saying that you necessarily have to have carbs, um, he was saying that he want, you want like a bit of a, of a, uh, a, a glucose bump, insulin bump, and that can be helpful. Um, he was saying mostly that he saw the problems in people that were just not eating enough fat. 
And so I think that's probably part of the problem. Also, if you think about it, you know, you're saying that like if you eat more protein and that turns into glucose, that's going to raise your glucose a bit. And it, it but he was saying that when you do that sort of internally, it does raise insulin, but it's not all that much. It's just a little bit. So you want like a bit more of a bump um, and then to do those sorts of things. Um, but I haven't had any problems with that. I haven't seen any other people have problems with that. The Inuits don't have any problems with that. Our ancestors didn't have problems with that. Again, crossing the land bridge from Asia to America, you know, they weren't eating carbs outside of the glycogen in, in the meat and organs that they were eating. So I'm still of the opinion that there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. There are entire civilizations and populations that don't eat carbohydrates their entire life after weaning. All mammals don't eat carbs after weaning. So no, I don't think you need it. I think you need to get everything else right. And if you do get everything else right, then, then you'll be fine. And if, you know, if you're, you're growing, you get that bit of an insulin burst, is that going to help you grow a bit more? Is that going to be a bit of a cheat to get you going? Maybe, you know, like there, uh, you know, one of the previous questions was, was, you know, if you're drinking milk and, and I would, I would only drink raw milk if you're going to drink milk, um, that, um, you know, maybe they had some growth factors, maybe that little bump in insulin would, you know, help, you know, get energy into cells and help you grow. Maybe, um, I'm, I'm a fan of just doing things the way we're sort of designed and, and, you know, we don't need, we don't need milk after we're weaned, you know, uh, we do need fat. And so getting things like butter and stuff like that, sure. But I don't think we need carbs. No. Um, and I, I don't think that Rob really thinks that too. I think he's, he's, he's very much avoidant of carbs. Um, because he's, he's, you know, he, he talk, deals with carb addiction all the time. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that, um, I don't think that you need carbs. I think that, um, you know, there might be certain isolated incidences that, that carbs may be helpful. Like, um, I was just talking to someone, uh, earlier that, um, had, um, you know, an injury from, from the injections that, that she was forced to get. Um, and she had damage to her heart and there's, there's, there's growing evidence that you damage the, the metabolism of the heart and the, the metabolic health of the heart. So it all of a sudden can't run on ketones. Um, your heart primarily runs on ketones, preferentially runs on ketones. And if your heart can't run on ketones, that's a sign of metabolic distress in your heart. And so there are more studies showing that this is happening. And so, um, she said that this actually happened to her and, she was carnivore for two years, feeling great, but then this happened, and now she's just feeling awful and having a horrible time with things. And uh, unless she has some, some uh, uh, fruit, some carbs from fruit, so that's an injury, you know, and that that could potentially be the case that you know she may need that. I mean, you make carbs anyway, so I don't know if that's one hundred percent what's going on there, but um, but either way, maybe she just needs a bit more. And if you, if you have a sort of injury like that and, you know, that isolated circumstance, you know, maybe, and hopefully she gets better and recovers and doesn't need that anymore. But the vast majority of people, unless you're in a very, very specific, uh, situation like that, then no, I don't think you need carbs whatsoever. And I think you do better without them because you make them, you make all the ones you want, you make all the ones you need. Uh, Michael Mexler, can you address how cutting out the last 5%, uh, things like coffee really change your carnivore results? Yeah, basically you just, just get this exponential drop when you add in any plants because it just, it disrupts your metabolism physiology in, in a lot of different ways. You know, coffee, for instance, is it really, uh, disrupts your energy metabolism and you get a, an energy burst, but then you get a drop and you just feel like garbage coffee also comes with 150,000 other chemicals in it that are not caffeine. And so you get all those sorts of uh, problems as well. You get a lot of, a lot of inflammation. And so that's, um, you know, that's not what you want. I feel sore, um, um, you know, for, um, I feel sore for, um, you know, two days after I, after I drink coffee. So, you know, it's, um, it's uh, it is the case that there there are inflammatory factors in there, and there are problems in there. You just, just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. That builds up. If I have one cup of coffee, I'm sore for two days. What if I have a coffee every single day? It's going to build up inflammation. It's going to build up soreness. I'm not going to feel great. If you have any carbohydrates, that's going to completely upend and rearrange your metabolism. Your insulin goes up. It shuts down your your normal metabolic state, and um, and so even a small amount of carbs is going to 
cause a big disruption. And so you get more of an effect with the, the early introduction of these things. And then, you know, it's just like if you have an open watch or something like that with all the watch gears going on there, someone sprinkles some sand in there, I mean, it's going to destroy the watch and the mechanisms. It's going to run all cranky and gross. It could stop it all the, all the way. Now you can pour another pound of, of sand on there and that's going to make it worse. It's really going to stop. But, you know, you already did a lot of damage just putting a few grains of sand in the watch gears. We're fine-tuned machines. We're, we're very, very uh, fine-tuned uh, instruments. We're precision instruments. And uh, we need to think about it like that. So, you know, just a few grains of sand can can screw up the, the mechanisms. Lance McGuire, thank you for the super chat. In sunburn reactions, I assume the furanocumarins are carried to the source of exposure by the blood that makes the skin appear uh, red. Uh, yeah, that's sort of the idea. You know, I mean, they're just going to be throughout your body and they're just going to run throughout your whole body. You know, some of these furanocumarins are the ones that that uh, your body reacts with. And so you can't take certain med medications with them, like grapefruit. You can't eat grapefruit with, I think, statins and, and other short cardiac meds and other meds in general, because it's the same set of enzymes that are detoxifying the uh, furanocumarins in grapefruit that are that are then metabolizing these medications. So you probably get too much or too little of these uh, medications if you're if you're eating grapefruit. So it screws with the dose. Um, and yeah, it just goes all throughout your body. And then you get this sun exposure. And uh, it doesn't have to be red at the time, but obviously if the capillaries are open, you're a bit red, then that's gonna actually bring more blood in there, which could then certainly compound the issue if you have more furanocumarins being brought to the area as well. And so you just get more burns, you get more damage. And when, when exposed to, to UV light, Furanocumarins will permanently bind to proteins and DNA, causing permanent damage. And so that's when you peel is when you have permanent damage. So UV light actually penetrates very deep. If you, if you in a dark room, if you put a flashlight on your hand like that, it'll, it'll just glow, right? So the light's penetrating through that. And the, and the sun is much more, you know, those rays will, will penetrate much better than a flashlight will. So that actually is getting into your body. And those furanocumarins are in your blood and they're in your body causing damage. So you can get serious uh, uh, skin damage and uh, and burn very easy from that. Yeah. Uh, Eleanor, thank you very much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, so we're probably going to maybe cap it there on the, the super chats, everyone, just so we make sure we get through all these. We still have a number of questions to get through. So maybe we'll um, just cap it on the super chats for now. Um, and we'll, we'll keep going. I've, I've still got another sort of half hour, 45 minutes that I can go on because I'm, uh, I've got a bit of time today, so we'll see how long we go, but maybe, maybe slow these ones down and, uh, uh, make sure we get these, all of these. So question from Eleanor, um, copper's carnivore kitchen. Yes. Should I be doing the carnivore diet worried about vein and artery health. Yeah, look, I mean, this is, this is going to be good for not only your veins and arteries, but just for your general health as well. This is what we're designed to eat. This is how we were made biologically. This is what we're set up for. So you're going to improve your health in so many more ways than you can imagine. You know, doing this for a couple months, people look at this and, and they look back on their life and realize they've just felt like garbage their whole life. They come off all sorts of medications. They, they heal issues that they never thought could be healed. They didn't even realize they were problems until they were gone. Um, some people don't even realize how, how many problems were gone until they say like, all right, maybe I'll just go back to eating a normal meal. And they just feel like garbage. And they're like, I had no idea how good I felt until right now when I don't feel it anymore. So it makes a massive difference and it's, it's worth trying. It's not going to hurt you. You know, you do it for three months, you're going to see a dramatic improvement in your health and you're going to be, you're just going to feel fantastic and you'll probably improve, uh, your, you will objectively improve your health in a lot of ways. And so, you know, then you get to make the decision if that's something that you want to do and perpetuate the rest of your life or not, it's up to you, but, uh, at least give it a shot. You know, three months isn't going to hurt you. You know, even if, even if it, this were to cause heart disease, which it does not, um, and if anything protects against it, and I would say it would, um, three months is not going to, cause heart disease by any stretch of the imagination. It just takes years and years and years and decades, really. So uh, you, you really got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I would give it a try. I did give it a try and I'm still here. Baby Jesse James, thank you very much for the super chat. 
Uh, my 90 year old grandma has cirrhosis due to non alcoholic fatty liver disease and one kidney with CKD. So, non alcoholic fatty liver, liver disease, you basically just call that fructose fatty liver disease as opposed to alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's fructose fatty liver disease. That is the main driver of non alcoholic fatty liver disease, but also seed oils and excess carbs as well. Um, I've tried to get her on carnivore, but she keeps getting acid reflux, so she gives up. Uh, why would she be getting acid reflux? Thing? Well, some people do. Um, I've seen that. It's, it's quite rare. Most people fix their acid reflux. If she's only eating meat, only drinking water, generally don't have that problem. But um, take some antacids. You know, take a PPI, like some Nexium or something like that for a month. Let her transition into it. Um, this is not something she has to be on, on the rest of her life, but you know, sometimes you have weird reactions and things happening while you're transitioning. And if that's, if that's impeding her progress and transitioning and eating the things that are going to, you know, reverse and improve her fatty liver disease, it's not going to reverse cirrhosis. That's permanent scarring, but it can heal the rest of her liver and allow that to work normally. And, um, and the kidneys. Kidneys. I mean, we just we just heard from someone with serious kidney disease, and they 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 improve their kidney function. That's what we see. Higher protein content, uh, higher protein intake improves kidney function, and so um, that is what that is what you want to do. So, um, but yeah, if you need some some antacids, just don't get ones with sweeteners or artificial sweeteners or flavorings or any of that garbage. Um, uh, just some you know, just some, some antacid that's, that's not flavored or, uh, you know, PPI, some, something like that. You can, a lot of these things are over the counter. You talk to a pharmacist or her doctor to make sure it's appropriate for her. But, um, most of these things are pretty, pretty safe and, and, um, available over the counter. So that's what I would do and just get her through it and get her onto meat and it'll probably sort itself out. And after a month, she probably won't need the, 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 the PPI anymore. So good luck with that. Good luck to her. Uh, Tina Andre, thank you for the super chat. looks like there's a question down here. Tina says, I stopped taking my flaxseed oil supplements. Is this, this is good, right? Yes, that's, it's very good. Flaxseed oil is terrible. Flaxseed, flaxseed actually has a lot of cyanide in it, quite a lot of cyanide in it. Um, that's one of the studies that I'll be peppering on my, my Lane Norton uh, video. I mean, you won't see it because I just, I just literally just paper the whole screen with all these different studies. Oh, there's no human <laughs> dude. There's thousands. Uh, one of them was on, um, I talked about was on, uh, smoothies. They were looking at smoothies and looking at the cyanide content in just smoothies from different smoothie shops. And they were just getting these things and they were testing the cyanide content. There's actually a high cyanide content in these things higher than you would, you would, uh, want on a daily basis. So if you're getting smoothies every day with flaxseed and all that sort of, you're juicing and putting flax, flaxseed so good, so wonderful. Yeah, it's so good if you want if you want uh, more cyanide in your diet. Um, and so they were talking about that. They were talking about the the smoothies with flaxseed, with almonds, almond milk. Um, oh, and what else? Anyway, um, that uh, that that th these contributed to. Know, too much of a burden of cyanide. So yes, get rid of cyanide or yeah, get rid of cyanide. It's no good. And uh, cyanide comes with uh, flaxseed. So yes, definitely good. Um, people say, well, flaxseed, you want that because it has omega-3s. Well, it has the wrong omega-3s. First of all, it has ALA as opposed to DHA or EPA, which are the ones that we need for our brain. Um, and there are studies with, with flaxseed that actually shows that your EPA might go up a little bit, but your DHA, DHA goes down. So that's not what you want. 20% of your brain is made out of DHA. Don't want that to go down. Um, so I say, oh yeah, you get all the omega-3s you need from eating plants. No, you get the wrong omega-3s. That's like saying you need water. Water is a liquid, therefore drink vodka. Like, no, that's not, you need vodka. Vodka is the same. It's the same as water. If you just drink vodka, you'll get all the water you need. Well, there is water in vodka. That's true. But that's that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as just drinking water. And that's what they're saying too. You need omega-3, you need DHA and EPA. Those are omega-3s. Here's this other omega-3 too. Same, same. No, you don't just need omega-3s. You need specific omega-3s. And uh, you don't want the ALA. Um, uh, the, well, you don't, yeah, that's not, that's not what's going to get you where you need to go anyway. And it comes with cyanide and all sorts of other sort of toxins that are inherent to plants. And this is just this is this is the the basic crux of the argument. So yes, you did a very good thing getting rid of the the flaxseed oil supplements. 
uh, a wee scotch, a wee scotch. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. What is your opinion about uh, high protein run without adequate fat causing blood sugar and A1C to rise over time on carnivore? That's that's sort of what Dr. Sivas was talking about, that that, that can happen. Um, it's also going to just not make you feel as good. You know, I mean, you need the fat. It's, it's, a, it's an essential nutrient. And, um, and it has, a, has a, a lot of essential nutrients in it. So I think it's really important to get enough fat. It's, um, that uh, is really important. I don't think it's a good idea to limit fat. They, oh, when you're losing fat, you don't want to eat fat. That's not true. You just need, you need to eat food and your body will, will um, you know, you'll expend the excess fat because your body doesn't need it anymore and your metabolism is improving and your hormones are improving, which is uh, very much how... Um, how, how, how fat is, how weight gain and fat gain and fat loss is driven. These things are hormonal in nature. There's a massive, massive, massive um, influence by insulin, which is the fat storage hormone. Type 1 diabetics don't make insulin and they cannot put on fat. They get waste away until they die if they don't get insulin. And if you have too much insulin, like an insulinoma, a tumor that secretes insulin, doesn't matter what you eat. You get enormously obese very quickly. So insulin is very, very important um, in uh, in weight and, and fat loss as well. So that's very important. Um, sorry, just writing a note to myself. Okay. So the idea is that, that you can potentially, if you eat a lot more protein, that some of that can, the excess that you don't use, or really if you need to, um, if you don't have enough fat or something like that, and you're converting this into glucose, you might overstep that and make a little bit more. So it's, um, there's different, different contentions on that. Um, you know, if you talk to Dr. Sivas, he says that that's what he sees and that's what he, as he understands the biochemistry and, uh, um, professor, uh, Bart K, um, doesn't think that that's really the case, but either way, the solution is simple. Eat a lot of fat. So you eat a lot of fat, eat a high fat meat-based diet takes care of it either way. Def, uh, Jeff uh, Skolmer, thank you for the super chat. Um, recovering from laparoscopic appendectomy and now have a DVT. Any recommendations? Well, uh, yeah, well, you need to, you need to, you know, get on the, the treatment protocol with your, with your doctor, um, which is generally going to be on anticoagulants for a number of months um, depending. So, um, you know, eating a carnivore diet, I, it's certainly not going to hurt you. It's going to be very good for you when you're getting surgery and you're laying down and you're not moving, you know, you run a risk of, of developing DVTs, um, uh, regardless of your diet. So, you know, that's something that, that uh, needs to be treated. So I would certainly listen to your doctors on, on how to treat that medically. Don't listen to their diet advice if they're telling you not to eat meat. Um, absolutely nothing to do with with meat and and dvt so I, i'm sure they won't say that um uh, certainly in the context of the dvt but um you know eat a carnivore diet especially when you're recovering from surgery uh, on your on your gut because you know you want to rest the bowel and let that ease and you want very low residue you don't want a bunch of fiber and feces coming through there and, and bugging things so uh eat meat listen to your doctors about the uh, dvt and hopefully that settles down and you can get off the meds um, as soon as that's appropriate. Good luck with that. Edith Williamson, functional epilepsy since six years old, brain surgery in 2022, carnivore since December 23. On February, doctor took uh, my Valium and reduced my seizure meds in half. Hey, that's amazing. Well, that's really, really good. I'm really glad to hear that. And that, that sort of ties into the functional um, uh, neurological disorder with the, with the functional seizures previously, which is really, really good. Um, well, that's great. That's really good to hear that, that, the, that the dietary changes help with that as well. So I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Renar, thank you for the super chat. How much and when should we actually drink water? Uh, basically drink to thirst. You try to drink every day. Uh, most people don't drink enough. Um, you aim for increasing your water intake and see what your thirst does. Sometimes you know, when you, when you start, when you don't drink enough water, you, your body sort of shuts off your thirst signals. It just says, look, we're obviously not near water. We're not going to, we're not going to keep bugging them. 
Uh, and then you you start drinking two, three liters and all of a sudden your body goes, oh, hey, we have access to water. Get more of this. And you're, then your thirst starts kicking in. So sometimes people get, you know, they're only drinking one and a half a liter, you know, liter, liter and a half or something like that a day. And they're like, yeah, that's fine. And then they say, okay, well, I'll just try drinking three liters. And they drink three liters and all of a sudden they're like, I need more. And they drink like another two liters on top of that. So that can happen too. So maybe just try that, you know, see how much you're drinking. Try having, uh, you know, if you're only drinking sort of a liter, liter and a half, two liters, maybe try and bump that up to three liters, see how you go. And then listen to your thirst. If you're really just like, if you're getting to three liters and you're just like, oh my God, I don't want to drink anymore, then don't, that's fine. Um, but most people are not drinking enough and just, just give that a try. Uh, Barry Davis, uh, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. It's very kind of you. Um, hi, Dr. Chafee. I've been carnivore for almost seven weeks and enjoying it so far. I have Crohn's disease and my stomach feels fine, but I'm currently experiencing issues with uh, fistulas. Do you think that carnivore will help with a fistula? I do think so. Um, the, the literature says that um, the best treatment for uh, an acute flare-up of Crohn's, at least in this study, was um, – uh, an elemental diet, which is what a steak is, which is what a lion diet is. You're just getting the nutrients you need and nothing else. And that was a better treatment for acute flare-up of Crohn's than uh, prednisolone or prednisone, depending on the country you're in. And so steroids, right? So major steroids to, to decrease the, the, um, the, uh, the inflammatory system, you know, is a better, is um, not as good as just not eating certain things. So yes, I do think this will help. I think it will reduce the inflammation. It will reduce the problem, reduce this getting, stop this from getting worse and give your body a chance to heal. Now you may need surgery. You may need some sort of intervention to help with these fistulas, depending on where it's fistulating to. Fistula is a, is a connection between two hollow organs or maybe the surface of the skin. So you get like, um, you know, something from like basically a tube, so it's like this inflammation sort of burrows through and sort of cavitates through. And then it, you know, like maybe you have like an abscess sort of growing through and then it hits into another organ and now it pops through and now it's just draining in between those two organs. So like you can get like a, a, a colovocycle uh, fistula where it goes from your colon to your, to your bladder or it can get to the surface of the skin, all these sorts of things. Um, they can be very, very difficult to treat. So definitely go through you know, the normal treatments with your doctor, you know, and uh, it may be that medications can help you for a short term, but, um, and allow your body to heal. But, you know, if you just do a carnivore diet, that should reduce the swelling immensely and reduce the antibodies and allow your body to heal as well. So I think, yes, that it would help with that. Sometimes you still need help. Sometimes you still need medicine. Sometimes you still need surgery, depending on, on how bad it is and, and, and what's happening. So, uh, good luck with that. I do think you're on the right track though. Um, uh, red meat and water only. That's the main thing that that's what you're going to do best on is, uh, is the lion diet for Crohn's disease and any, any autoimmune disease. So, uh, I would give that a try. High fat, lots of fat. Good luck with it. Mary Shepard, thank you for the super chat. I'm so thankful for your answers uh, to myself and others have. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad that it's helpful. I hope it's helpful to other people as well. And if you guys do find it helpful, please do comment and uh, like and uh, let other people know. And I'll do more of these. Annie, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, my son is on the autism spectrum. He is 21, six foot tall and weighs 111 pounds. He has been on carnivore for a week and we are seeing neurological gains already. Um, can he gain weight on a diet? Well, first of all, that is fantastic news. I'm really happy to hear that he's already gaining improvement. Uh, I, I think that's just a product of him going into ketosis and, uh, and getting proper energy, um, uh, dynamics in his brain, which is amazing. And I think these are going to continue to improve at 21. Your brain is still partially plastic. Well, we're all plastic, uh, brains to, to a degree, but he can, he can actually gain back some ground, which I, I, I hope that he does. Um, yeah, he's quite skinny. Um, but yes, you can certainly gain weight on this diet. You just need to eat enough. So a lot of people come to this because they want to lose weight, but People come to it because they want to gain weight too. They want to put on muscle. They want to put on lean body mass. They don't just want to put on a bunch of fat, right? Which is not what you want. It's like these bulking. You have to eat tons of fat in order to put on muscle. Yeah, you can't put on muscle unless you put on fat. Nonsense. Of course you can. Uh, you just have to eat the right thing. You have to do it in the right way. And so people that tell you that, oh, this is how you, this is how you put on muscle. You have to put on a bunch of fat. They don't know what they're talking about. 
if you just eat a bunch of meat, a lot of high fat, you know, high quality meat, and you work out, you will put on lean muscle mass and only lean muscle mass. And you'll it'll actually improve your um and you improve your your muscle gains more than than you would by any other by any other means. So yes, you can definitely put on weight. You just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Um, need to impress that upon him that it's not just a when I feel like that he can stop, it's when it stops tasting good. So if he finishes his plate and and that still tastes good, you know, he should ask for more or or get some more. Very important. Now maybe that there's some you know, communications issue. I don't know his exact situation, but if it, um, first of all, we hit 2000, that's pretty amazing. That's the first time hit 2000 and went immediately back down, which is why I called it when it happened. But, um, uh, 2000, pretty cool. But, um, the, uh, the, the thing is, though, is that, that he, he needs to be, you know, understand that, that, he eats until it stops tasting good. So he just keeps eating while well, it's enjoyable if he's only eating meat. So he's fatty meat, high fat, very high fat, brain's made out of fat. You want all that fat. You want all those ketones for the brain, the proper functioning and neural development and, and restructuring. You can you actually you know redo a lot of, of um, structures in the brain, uh, which is, I mean, not, not the whole structures. If you're missing a lobe, you know, it's not coming back. But you know, the, but you can do a lot. You can do a lot, especially with the you know the the connections in between the neurons and the different um, connections in the brain. So and the functionality of the neurons as well. And this will keep getting better as you go. And the mitochondria get better and better and better and stronger and stronger and stronger and more plentiful. They'll get better, and he will gain weight. Just eat meat until it stops tasting good. He's very skinny. Probably need to try to eat two three times a day maximally. Eat until it stops tasting good. And do that at least twice a day and see if he can start exercising. If he can do sprints or if he can do resistance exercises, you know, even just push ups, sit ups, body weight squats, pull ups, things like that. Those will do a lot for him to stimulate his muscle uh, development and growth and for helping put on healthy weight and healthy lean body mass. Um, okay. Well, we got down to the end of the, of the questions. That we had there, we were answering some uh, Facebook questions and the questions that uh, popped up in in uh, YouTube as well. And um, you know, so I don't know if anyone has any more sort of last couple of questions that are burning burning a hole in their brain. But um, um, let me see here. I'm going to pop over. So I'm on Streamyard, but I just want to see if. Uh, if there's anything up on just actual YouTube itself. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, okay. There's a couple questions. So why don't we, yeah, we'll probably just finish up with these couple questions. I think these are from um, like Facebook as well. Um, Sinclair Cole said, I went carnivore November in 22, lost 70 pounds and all labs became great. Awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's, that's typical. If you're able to stay with it, that's, that's what happens. And that's really great to see. Thank you very much for sharing. Maybe other people, you know, let us know your, your results, you know, write that in the comments, write that in the chat. Um, and especially the, the comments, let people know, you know, it's really important to let as many people know, you know, what people's results are because people come to these things and they say like, well, what's this? I heard about this, you know, maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll sort of ask questions or whatever. And they come see, and they just see more and more and more people having the results that they want and they need. And that's very helpful to them. So, um, you know, please do comment and let people know your, your experiences with it. Even the negative experiences that helps people learn too. They say, Hey, I did this and this didn't work very well. What do I do? How do I fix this? You know, and other people would be able to comment and say, Hey, I did that too. This is how I fix that. So, you know, it's not going to be flawless and seamless for absolutely everybody every time. You know, it, it is it, it is something that you have to sort of learn and, and see see how to do it properly and and get enough of what you need. So it's uh, it's important to have these discussions and uh, and the comment section is a great place to do that. So question uh, cats on carnivore, how much should they eat as much as they want? as much meat as the, as they, they want to. So, um, you know, raw is what you need for cats 
and um, and actually like like meats not not like minced up, chewed up. They, they they need to be chewing on things, ripping it off the bone. They be chewing up the bone. Um, if it's raw, then you know it's okay. The, they can deal with the bones. And so um, you know, I give give my cat just a just a, just a ton of meat. Um, and I just keep, you know, I give him money and then, and I'll see him stop and he'll just stop at a certain point. You know, his body's telling him to stop just like it tells us to stop. Right. And so, um, so that, that's what I do. Just give them, give them as much as they want. They're not going to get fat on meat unless they're eating other stuff. Uh, don't do that. Um, and, and same for dogs as well. Just, just let them go to town and, uh, H. Ahmad, um, thank you very much for the, Super chat. I don't see a question attached, but maybe one below. And then Sandra McConnell says that I reversed my kidney, disease, my chronic kidney disease. And my doctor was super impressed. That's great. Um, you know, hopefully your doctor asked questions and and had an open mind about the answers as well. And uh, lovely. Okay. All right, everyone. I think I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much for joining. I am going to do my Lane Norton uh, reply and rebuttal. Uh, tomorrow around the same time. So 9 a.m. Uh, Perth time, which would be 5 p.m. PST and um, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in America. So if you can uh, come to that, please do. Um, and uh, Or is it Eastern Daylight Time? Anyway, Eastern Time. Um, so thank you very much for... Um, uh, thank you very much for coming on. I'll be doing these lives on Wednesdays for me, Fridays for me on those two days. And so please do come to the next live uh, in two days. So that'll be Thursday in the US and and Friday in Australia. And, uh, and then we'll try to do this uh, as well, maybe at a different time next week on the Wednesday, just because I have, I have appointments early, but uh, we'll see how we go. And um, yeah, and please do come in for the, the premiere for the, the Lane Norton um, rebuttal uh, tomorrow because that's important to get more of that out there so we can get people knowing that you know th that these claims that people are making uh, are not founded and they're not um, and they're not based in in the facts and and the logics and so we need to point that out and so I sort of did that in a bit of a snarky way so um, because it's just it's just a silly silly thing for him to do and so. You know, I just wanted people to know about that. So please do, if, if you can come to that, please do. It makes it a big difference if people come to the premiere and hit like and make comments and drive up the engagement. It, it suggests that out to um, to more and more people, and that really helps. And uh, Tina says, "I bought Women's World Dr. Chafee article." <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I was on the I was on the the cover of uh, Women's World magazine in the states, and they did a whole expose on a carnivore diet and and uh, asked me about that. And so that's the, the, the main article in the, in the middle is that. So it's, it's sort of fun being a magazine. I didn't really see that coming. It was sort of surreal when they asked me about it. I, it just sort of didn't seem real. I was, I was like, mm, okay. And then you know, people came and we had the interview and, and uh, they took pictures of me and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden I'm on a magazine and it still didn't feel real until it actually saw that it was just, it was just sort of bizarre, but it's kind of fun as, as well. And it's nice that, more and more people are, are are coming around to this, and that that's making a more mainstream appeal. So that so that that outlets like Women's World Magazine says, hey, you know, a lot of our a lot of our um, readers are interested in this, and so this is what we want to give them because we want to give them uh, something uh, something that they like. And so it's nice to see more of that. And um, yeah, and thank you all. It was very uh, very nice people saying very nice things. So thank you all very much for that. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll put up the announcement for the premiere for the Lane Norton thing tomorrow. And um, and then uh, hopefully see you all there. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. It's really great turnout today. Hopefully we can keep this up and it'd be great to see you all next time. Thank you all. See you at the premiere tomorrow.